Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Southern Outdoorsman Podcast. we got a special one for you, one that's been a while in the making. We're uh, fresh back from uh, deer hunting, hence the camo. Well, I am, at least, except Jacob's not. Uh, today, we got a, a long time coming, man. Jonathan Holsenback, we have uh, talked about you on the podcast a good bit. Uh, people have heard you referred to as John Boy, Johnny Boy. We've talked about you a lot. We've ran into you several times over the years mm-hmm. on uh, some public. So how are you doing, man? Good, good. Coming off a fresh kill last three, four days ago, and just trying to figure this rut out around here. Yeah, man. Killed a magnum of a seven point. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, we also got a return guest, Mr. Baxley Shores. Baxley, what's up, man? Nothing. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. You were on a year ender like two years ago, right? Yeah, I was. Um, oh, it was two years ago. Because it was yeah. in my old house. Yeah. Yeah, and we were talking about how you were hunting scrapes and you were killing all these bucks, and then now we're going to talk about how you quit doing that and quit killing bucks. <laughs> yeah, no, I kind of made a mistake this year um, <laughs> as, as far as this week goes. Normally, this week, second week of December, I get after them, uh, and I've always killed one the second week of December on scrapes. And for whatever reason this year, I decided I was going to back off of them just a little bit and hunt long straightaways, power lines, roads, clear cuts. Um, I saw plenty of deer, but I didn't see the big deer like I normally do. And looking at the cameras, I should have stayed where I was, you know. Um, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. So, oh, man, it'd be that way. Jacob, how are you? <laughs> doing good, doing real good. So, uh, Thomas shot a nice buck this week, and uh, I hunted a little bit. Saw a bunch of bunch of button bucks. That's about it uh, this week. So it's been a little slower. It's not like Jonathan, you know. Jonathan's over here putting down hammers, and uh, we got a wall behind us as well. We kind of showcase that for all the YouTube viewers. By the way, if you're listening to this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, maybe you're on iHeartRadio, go over to YouTube. This will be a really good episode to listen to because we're in uh, Jonathan's shop right now. Got a few of the deer behind us, not all of them, but a decent amount of the deer behind us, and it's a pretty impressive wall. But uh, no, I'm super excited for this episode. So, Jonathan, I'm, I'm real quick. Uh, I, I want to get into a little bit of your background hunting Alabama and especially, you know, jumping from like hunting clubs over to public land. Have you always hunted public land or has it been one of those things that you just kind of jump into it, you know, kind of later on? And, I no, guess no. As soon as, as soon as I was eligible to drive, we, we uh, jumped right into them. I mean, we, we kind of hunt the club on the weekends that there's not a management hunt, you know. Kind of give our club a break, go over there, and, and we hunt the management area any time we can. You know, $20 is, for that amount of land, it's, it's hard not to. Yeah. Well, so. also, speak about hunting public land. I ran into you, I guess, was that 20, when did that kill that big deer? Was it 2020? Yeah, because it was three yeah. years ago. So I, I met you mm-hmm. uh, in 2020 when I had shot a buck, and you were in there and actually helped me get it out with my brother, which yep. was... Dude, that was one of the dumbest things I've ever done. We should have, I should have cut that deer up and, and, and just packed it out because where that deer was at, we had to pull over all that deadfall yep. in that little cut and then go up one of the steepest embankments I've ever seen with a deer, gear, with a deer cart. Um, and, and I was telling Andrew this on the way here and telling my brother as well. I'm like, we should just cut that sucker up and throw it in our backpack and walked out because that was, that was miserable. Then afterwards, Andrew, while we're at the truck, I think taking photos and talking, we hear Andrew shoot one. Yep. And we drive over and help Andrew get his buck out. <laughs> yep. And uh, that was the first time I met you. And I was like, man, this this dude seems pretty legit. And you were talking about a lot of your experience and killing a lot of good deer, mm-hmm. but also just like a little bit of kind of like your thought process of like how you hunt some of these areas. Because I was in an area that you were hunting with one of your sons. Um, mm-hmm. And it kind of just opened my eyes up. I'm like, man, we have to try to get this guy on the podcast and, and talk a little bit about it. Um, so one thing I wanted to kind of get in with you is – it's kind of interesting because we'll post, say, Andrew will say post some photos of like trail cam images of certain deer. And you're like, man, that's over in this spot, isn't it? I'm like, how'd you know? <laughs> yep. and, or like, actually, a deer behind us, listeners can see this or uh, YouTube viewers can see it. A deer that I, we had kind of named the Medusa buck because he's got a bunch of crazy points coming all over the place. Um, we had trail cam photos of that deer. When that was, when did you, was that three years ago you killed that deer? 21. 21. 21. So two years ago, and then um, you knew all about that deer. And then when we came mm-hmm. over here, and you told me you had a lot of history with him. You killed that buck on your place, um, you know, really close to the public land. And come to find out you had a crazy amount of history, which kind of gets into what I'm curious with is, like, you building history with specific deer and targeting mm-hmm. specific deer versus, like, you know, a guy like myself who I'm just trying to find, you know, a good representation of the property, you know, a nice mature buck if possible. And you're not necessarily like that. You're more so, from what we've talked about, 
trying to find and hone in on a couple specific bucks and trying to hunt those specific That's bucks, right. whether it's on your hunting club or on a piece of public land. Yep. So, like, with that deer, I want you to talk about a little bit of the history and, like, the special characteristics of that deer when it comes to, like, his sheds. And, again, maybe one reason why that deer didn't, wasn't getting killed come gun hunts on some of the piece of public land. Yeah. Um, never seen the deer, actually, um, first. Found his sheds first. Mm-hmm. Then went after the deer. Um, let's see. I think one of my uncles found one of his first sheds that he dropped over there that we actually put our hands on. And after that, started running cameras early, early fall, you know, right before bow season. Um, and he, he would hold his antlers until week prior to gun season and he would shed his velvet around October 18th and 19th every year and he had something wrong with him we believe is testosterone or something like that uh, it was out of whack but it, it was like clockwork every year I mean you, you and really shed all the antlers that I found from him probably within 300 yards of five years worth of antlers and that deer and gives more context so he was holding velvet until you know mid-october um and then he was shedding his antlers around mid of november before gun season came yep. in yep which is insane and, and actually I, when you told me that and actually i got to see some of his sheds because you have again roughly almost five years of history with sheds from yep. that deer mm -hmm. um his bases are like concave like the bases of the antlers like yep. there's like an inch and a half two inches of you know calcium bone missing yep. in like every one of his sheds and then when you kill the deer uh we actually pulled it pulled the uh mount off the wall a little while ago and inside if you looked at the top of his bases he's got all these points like these brow tines and everything coming out and they're like it's hollow up there. It's mm -hmm. like almost like a little uh it's like a little shot glass. Yeah, well, yeah. shot glasses <laughs> in like in his bases from up top where like rainwater and everything would kinda, you know, probably fall into it. Mm. Which is just a crazy characteristic. So really between the bottom of the uh the little shot glass, as you could say, on top of his bases, to probably where that concave airspace is, probably isn't more than an inch of actual bone in there. That's right. Which is crazy to think I mean, about. It, it's almost like his, his new antlers went ahead and just pushed his old ones right off, you know. That's that's crazy. Now, with that, I, I am curious, since, again, you talked about, like, having history with that deer. That deer. You also were, te were telling us today, like, the, uh, the big seven point you just shot, uh, you had a lot of history with. W what is, when did you start getting to the point when you were trying to find specific bucks and build history with them to actually go kill that deer versus just doing what most guys would do, which is just hit the woods and, you know, scout a little bit, run cameras, but they're not necessarily always building history with bucks. So they're just trying to find a good buck to go kill. I've, I've been the average hunter out there. You know, I used to whack whatever come through and you know, whatever was legal hit the ground. But then when you start getting pictures of one guy and you're like, man, that, that that's a good deer right there. And then, you have a camera on the other side of the property and still getting him over there. And it's just, it's more of a puzzle, you know, P putting him together. And it, I've, in my truck, I've got notepads of deer. Okay. I got him on this area right here, such and such times, you know, and then it's just, we just, I go all the way down every one of his sightings, at different spots. And then you start basically drawing him out on a map every time, you know, it's just, putting his circle together and when you can do that and then you can almost start seeing stuff that you know on on these kind of days this, this sunny day mm -hmm. he's more likely to come out over here versus a rainy day or windy day whichever way the wind's blowing you know he might come out over here versus over there and so when you can start connecting those dots all together is it makes it more of a challenge i mean yeah, deer hunting's really challenging, but going after one specific buck is really, really challenging. But at the end, it makes it all worthwhile a whole lot better. Um, but I don't know how long, probably uh, 
12, 13 years now. You've been doing that? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Ever, ever since about my first my first son was born, um, was I know that deer. Uh, he was actually, we was in a shooting house, and me and my wife and him was in there when I shot it. So, and that, that's the reason I know it's been that long, because he was a baby. We got a picture of him still holding <laughs> his bottle in that shooting house floor. We still have those pictures, and it's, it's one of them bucks up there, actually. Oh, that's awesome, man. And yeah, I got an eight-month-old at the house. We're taking her on her first deer hunt over Christmas. Oh, are you? Oh, yeah. We, talk, mean, we, talk we got about the headphones and everything. I'm excited. Oh, yeah. Yeah, she's yeah. been around gunshots a good bit. And she oh, she good. handles it. She went on a quail hunt with us. Yeah. We're see, busting put, birds in front of her. Put earmuffs on her. She was good to go. She, we had her in a little chest harness. She was ready to rock. That's right. Yeah, man. I, I want to get into a little bit more of your upbringing. You said earlier that you – you were in the same club since like '88 or something like that. Well, they they have leased it since they. I mean, you know, I I didn't become an official member until I turned 16 and started having to pay gotcha. myself. But you know, with my my dad and my uncles and all, it's always been a small, small, four or five person club. You know, we didn't have but 360 acres forever. Um, up actually up until two three years ago, and when we picked up some more land. But um, yeah, it's always been. But our it's always been at 360 for the longest time, but it backed up to the uh, local management area that's around here. And uh, so, especially during bow season, I mean, it wasn't nothing to just, you, it was legal. You could walk across the line, you know, and go over there and bow hunt, or whatever you needed to do. And then on the gun hunts, you kind of knew really where the deer were traveling because you did all the research so close to it, you know, to begin with. So, and we just started branching out. You kind of get tired of hunting one spot, so we'll move on down the road and try the next spot. And, and then the cameras came along, man, and that was a game changer there. Mm -hmm. How's uh how I don't know how I don't know how your club is structured or your lease is structured, but like, do y'all has it been logged or anything since you've been hunting it? Like clear cuts, anything like that? Yes. Um, we're actually due for our three sixty. That we've had forever. I've seen it completely cut once. Um, they are now to the point where they just went in and done a select cut on it. Um, so within a few more years, then they're going to go in and do a, uh, a complete harvest, I guess you would say. But some of our bigger deer that I know of and, and have got footage of has actually came from whenever it was clear cut. Really? So that's kind of what I was wondering about, actually, is when it, you know, since you've been through like a full cycle that, you know, not many people have hunted land that long where you've mm -hmm. been through a full timber cycle. Yep. Because uh, it's like, you know, 20, 30 years. Yep. How, you know, how has the property changed and, and y'all adapted with it? Like, what was that cycle like where clear cut, y'all are killing big bucks and then it kind of starts tapering off? Like, what, what was that like? It wasn't so much that we were killing them. We were definitely <laughs> seeing them, though. Um, we got two of them. Um, we, we had a 155-inch 10-point that was killed by one of our guests. Um, was that the last time y'all invited them? <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it was. <laughs> um, we had another guest killed uh, probably a high 20s, maybe a 30, you know, as a guest. Um but that was that particular deer, uh, that one twenty one thirty. It, it was back whenever it was clear cut. And man, I I can remember back then just sitting there on on a ridge top, looking and seeing a bachelor group of just bucks go across that. Man, you don't see that around here usually. And and then you know after they planted and all, it kind of started. You, you lost track of them, and next thing you know it. We went several years, you know, talking about that cycle, and after they planted, and as they, you had, you know, five, six years of pretty decent hunting, and then once they kind of got to where 10, 12 foot tall and all, it kind of just petered off, you know. They, they were still deer there, but not those giants. Okay. Know. That's, that's one, one thing I was curious about was when that, when your timber cycle gets to that, I don't know what it would be like. Ten, like eight to ten year range where those pines i mean they're too you like you're not hunting them uh but the deer are still using them like how did y'all adapt to that i mean it just got really tough at that point 
I think that's when I started getting a whole lot more interested in management areas. Yeah. I mean, because we impenetrable, you know. Mm -hmm. You can't go in there and do no scouting and that stuff. You just find where they pop out of them things. It's like the rabbit hole. You ride them down the road. and Yeah. And, you know, if you see a good crossing with a bunch of tracks everywhere, you know, you just set up and hunt the road at that point if you don't have any green fields right there. So, mm -hmm. um, it... I wasn't a fan of that of that time frame, you know, where it was so so thick that you couldn't do anything. Um, but the clear cut was been the best, and now that they've went in and select cut, you know, it it's been the select cut's been pretty good, you know, because I, th I think the deer feel a little more comfortable. They still got a little bit of cover, you know, and then but we're able to see them a little bit more. So um, I'm I'm a fan of the select cut so far. It's just Man, it's in the years in between that wasn't real good. How, how many years was that, would you say? Oh, man, probably five, ten, somewhere in there. You know, that was just, what do you do with this, you know? <laughs> yep. <laughs> it just. You pack up and go somewhere else. Right, right. <laughs> you go find your local WMA and wear it out. But, yeah, I, I was definitely not a fan of that. Um I mean, they left the SMZs and stuff there, and, and that's where we got some of our deer, but uh, that, that thick stuff wasn't great. Yeah. So uh, I really want to get into what you were mentioning about keeping track of all your deer and, mm -hmm. and taking notes. That's very interesting. But so you ended up getting into – when did you get into trail cameras? Do y'all Are y'all old enough to remember the – what is it, 32 millimeters? Nope. When you had to take your no, you go process. Yeah, you yeah, take and process. Yeah. No, we never had. That was a little bit before my time. Oh man, so it's been that long ago. I mean, when Moultrie first come out with some of those cameras, and you'd take your little roll out and go to Walmart and wait a couple of days just to get a thirty or forty pictures of a bunch of things of grass going <laughs> back and forth in front of your camera, and you paid that kind of money and waited so long for. Uh, that was. <laughs> That was horrible. Um, but, yeah, I, I think I started out with one or two. And um, over the years, and, and since they, I think I run at one time a few years ago. I have to keep a notebook in my truck, too, because I've got every one of them numbered. And you get to one point where you're just like, I don't even know how many cameras I got or where they're at. So now I've got them all numbered. And then I have to write down on my notebook when I get back in the truck this number camera is so and so and this one is here and um you know i'm running 23 to 25 you know a lot of that's on management area too and man it's it's all over the board so you really lose track of where you're at it, it's <laughs> funny it's funny you bring that up about uh keeping them organized so you remember where they're all at so back in 2020 we ran a bunch of trail cameras uh on part of some public and uh, I thought I had pulled all my cameras, and I went back to hunt one of those spots after JT shot that buck. And I roll up, and I start going in the woods, and I walk up. I'm like, man, there's a trail camera here. I'm like, that's my trail camera from 2020. <laughs> and I go pull it, and the camera's trash. It's It's been sitting in the rain for three years, and it had water log. It was water logged and everything. And I can't remember if I took the SD card out or someone else took the SD card out because uh, it didn't have SD card in it. But the little bungees going around that, that pine tree – was it quietly grown to the tree, but it was tight enough you'd have to cut the bungees off from that tree. And My it kind of goes back to what you're saying about keeping everything organized so you remember where all those cameras yeah, are Yeah, speaking of you and cameras, Jacob, um, <laughs> I've been waiting on this. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> I seen a deadfall one day that had a camera on it. And, I, and it's a stealth cam. Kind of over there where uh -huh. we, uh, in, in that area, you uh -huh. know, it, Am uh, I on the camera? Man, you put the damn thing up. <laughs> okay, and the, if you had the date right, it was about one or two years later. <laughs> this tree had fall. Actually, a, a big tree fell mm -hmm. and, and landed on this tree that you had this one attached to. <laughs> so I get home. I mean, I don't even know if the camera worked or not. I didn't care. It was, it popped that SD card in, and it's like... 
I know that guy. That is Jake. <laughs> I don't even know where that camera's at. I'm trying to think. <laughs> I mean, I'm glad you picked it up because I don't remember. How many more cameras? That's what I'm saying. Dude, I'm actually, it made me think. So I went through that. I went through a loop of that area where I had some other trail cameras. I went to check and see if I had any other cameras out there. I told I I knew that you left them out there. I told you I was like, hey, you got you still got two cameras in this thicket, or you and, had and, that one. And the stealth cams I haven't used <clears throat> since I think twenty twenty. Yeah, it's been twenty. It's a little camouflage one actually. It's over there on the shelf. <laughs> and it was on a deadfall, and the tree fell over. <laughs> yep. Well, I mean, I guess it was still on a good tree, but the dead tree came and fell, and then knocked that little tree over too. I'm, I'm, uh -oh. trying, I'm trying to think. Where did I put <laughs> right a here. stealth cam out there? Look, one, he's, got, he's got it on the map. Yeah, let's see. What we got? Let me try to find it here. Okay, if, if this. Uh-huh. All right, here we go. <laughs> Is that ringing any bells? Actually, and I found some deer bones, and I don't think a dead oh, head there, too. I, I, I got that dead head. When no, you, you oh, did when, when, when did you find the bones? Oh. <laughs> I'll show you. Dude, I spent a week over there looking for I knew did, there was going to be a did, dead did, head. Did you there. shoot one? No, no. Oh, I, I just seen the bones after I found your I, camera. I, 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 I got the head. It's a, it. it's a stud. It's a stud. Cell. Oh, I guarantee you, the, uh, the, the bones were big. <laughs> we had that buck on camera a mile away as the crow flies further down that, that road it you him? found it off of. It was possibly <clears throat> somewhere. Man, that's been a while. So, I had, so, the one, so one I left was right here. So the one, the one I was talking about that I left was sitting right okay, here. Okay, yeah. It was kind of at the beginning of a little... It's, that Almost some hardwood, right? Yeah, in there. but now that tree, that camera's still there. I left it on that tree. That's the one that was grown into the tree. Now, it, but it was a stealth. I had a stealth cam in there, and that took it out because I don't know if you try that camera. Uh, if you try to use that camera, uh, it looks like um, it's kind of some two D sonar of the deer. <laughs> like if the deer is like you know me to you know all the people behind the camera right now, you can't. If it's a nighttime image, you can't tell anything other than eyes. I mean that stealth cam over there. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it's something like that. <laughs> That is hilarious. No, I did have one. There was oh, yeah, you had one. All right. I want to see you the photos of myself. I don't know what I did with Dang. it. That's been a while ago. <laughs> no. No, it's a wild game. I was gonna, that, that one that's, the one that's still in there, I haven't cut it off the tree yet. It's a wild game. What about that little one? Right? Yeah. <laughs> Why did you leave it in there? I just didn't. Because I was going in and hunt. I was like, that I'll get one. it later. Is that, is that not your camera? Yes. I know it is. <laughs> yes. It, that's your camera. It's a POS. You can keep it, too. I've yeah. never even tried it, oh, man. Don't, I mean, yeah, it's not worth the 30 bucks I paid for it. <laughs> um, I'd re-gift it somebody I hated. <laughs> hey, and, and the Santa gift. The funny thing was, was the tree you had it on, it was kind of more of a sapling. I'm trying to think. It was that. bent over. Uh-huh. At the time, it still worked, and there was, it was like sideways, and oh. there was deer eating the leaves hold on, hold on. <laughs> off the top of that tree. You were still getting deer on camera. <laughs> no, right? after the tree oh, fell on. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Are you sure? Was it was it was it in that? SMZ? Right, it was. Or was it in? Because I had was one it, like that in this SMZ. And that Man, tip. see, when I go shed hunting, I start out here. Yeah. And I walk them edge of them pines uh -huh. all the way around, back and forth, well, weave in and out, and. I had it, one of those stealth cams right there on a on a little. It was a little pine tree or something like that. Yeah. And uh, but well, whatever I, this was, they was eating leaves out of the top. Okay. Of it. Well, no, it wasn't. Dude, because I, I thought I left that camera, so I, I swung back through here to see if that camera was still still there. I'm like. pretty sure though it was on that side of that. <laughs> because it was right out there where them bones was, not far from it. Okay, I did have another camera now there. Man. Yeah. I forgot yeah. every one of those cameras that was in that yeah. garage. Well, look. Well, there's your, there's your camera back. <laughs> no, dude. Okay. That's like, you'll go in the trash anyways. That thing was rough. Did I have any bucks on that camera? No. Oh, you lying son of a gun. No, I'm dead serious. <laughs> I mean, I wanted it to be. Trust me. That's the easy spot to get to for me. <laughs> I really wanted it to be. Oh, man. That's crazy. No, the, uh, that is, that is hilarious. Man. Full circle. Yeah, well, again, goes back to what I said earlier. <laughs> Keep track of your cameras. I think there's still probably three or four out there somewhere. For sure. So, For sure. Because I was wondering, I was like, man, because one time when we ran all those cameras back in 2020, I think I bought 15 Tascos. Um, and uh, I, 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 They're scattered all across Alabama right yeah, now. Yeah, and I'm like, I don't have them now. <laughs> <laughs> like, I think I gave a couple to my brother, but my brother doesn't have 10, 15 Tascos. So I don't know where they're. So if someone runs across a Tasco, it's probably like, you know, <laughs> a it's, been, it's really weathered. It's, it might be mine. Yeah, that's like a couple of weeks ago. I was going to a new place for hunting, and I was like, Jacob, just give me all your cameras. Like, you ain't going to put it. He hadn't put a camera out in like three years. I'm like, just Arkansas, give me all your cameras. I put all the ones out in Arkansas, son. Oh, yeah, that's true. Well, there's Thomas. And, you know, yeah. But, uh, no, the, so, 
got so sidetracked with that story. Uh, so going back into what Andrew was talking about with the trail camera application, was it pretty early on? Well, I know you said it was like 12, 12, 13 years ago is when you started doing like the individual, like focus on specific bucks. But at what point did it go from like, I just want to get photos of bucks to like getting to like, I want to find a specific buck or two or three to go target. Uh, it, it was more, a, I want to say, you know, at that time we probably only had one good shootable buck on mm -hmm. our club, you know, that we seen, you know. So it was like everybody was going after that one deer, and so I'm going to do whatever it takes. You know, everybody else going to go sit in their same shooting house every single day, and the older ones, sorry, Dad, but <laughs> you know, and my uncle. <laughs> to me, you don't. Yeah, he he's shot a couple of our target bucks doing that out of the same shooting house, you know. But mm -hmm. I want to get there quicker than just sitting and hoping. Yeah. Um. So we we, we just start scattering cameras out, even if it's for one deer, the only shootable deer we got over there, and then we just scatter them. So what would you put them on though? <laughs> like, what would you put your cameras on? Would you put them on a food plot to begin with, and then move it off into SMZ, or would you move it? Like, would you slowly backtrack, or would you just... Y'all had an episode with Homan? Jeff yeah. Homan, yeah. I'm like, man, this guy, he wrote the book for me. I mean, whenever he was talking, I'm like, this dude does everything I do. Oh, episode 122. Go look it up. All right, that's a wrap, folks. <laughs> <laughs> Shortest podcast interview of all time. <laughs> I mean, that was... I, I really couldn't believe it. I'm like, I'm going to listen to this twice. This this guy is, mm -hmm. I mean, I, he, he's older than me, mm -hmm. but he, he's probably been doing it a lot longer and probably got a whole lot bigger deer. But um, Hey, he's killed a couple good ones. Uh, I've seen his, his girlfriend, girlfriend just, just hammered. Killed a, I just seen. A hammer. That's a, that's a stud. Hammer. Because yeah. we, when we interviewed Jeff, I was like, Jeff, you ought to come up here, dude. Because, you know, where he hunts, like, he's still a month plus out from the mm -hmm. rut. And I was like, man, you ought to try this place out. And he tried it for the first time. He's only been hunting here for like three, four, four years. Yeah, like three or four years. And he's he's got on him quick. It's, it's been yeah. impressive, man. It's been real impressive. Anyways, <laughs> where were we? <laughs> but the whole backtracking thing, because hey, kind of what uh, uh, Baxley was asking. So that being said, like, what is like? Can I go? That's a great question, Baxley. What's your initial starting point for a man, camera? It, if you're trying to find if, a specific If deer. we had three or four people in the club, you know, on a weekend, and they're all hunting and say somebody sees a big deer on a green field, maybe come out eh, way after dark or something, you know, mm -hmm. while you're still sitting in the shooting house trying to ease out, and then the buck comes out. They talk, you know. I mean, they're going to come back. What did you see? Of course, it was the big one, but it was too dark to shoot. Mm -hmm. Well. Me sitting in the background listening, like, well, I know where that camera's going because he obviously comes to that green field. So that's just a sighting of him. I mean, go from there with it, you know. So is, that, him on that. Is, is that what happened two years or for the seven point you killed this year? Me telling you it ran across the road in front of me and <laughs> you, you went in there and then killed him this year? No. <laughs> I wish I it was that easy. Mouth shut, I wish I? it was that easy. Actually, you told me that last year, <laughs> but neither one of us knew that it was that deer. Mm. Well, yeah. So <laughs> but it, I mean, it's <laughs> but pretty close to um, the same. No, I I do get to the point where you know you just whether if you kill your shooter or not, but or your target book, should I mm. say, um, or somebody else kills it, you. Sometime there comes a time where you got to just start with a clean slate. You know, like, well, let's just put it on this major crossing right here that we know deer coming through, and there's buck tracks there. So you just start out right there if you don't have anything else going on, and that deer showed up. We had just picked up 700-something um, acres over there on the new lease and didn't, you know, we've hunted it um, on the management area hunts whenever it was management area, but... Um, it didn't ever really – you couldn't do too much scouting right in there because a lot of mm -hmm. people hunted it, mm -hmm. you know. You don't know if you're ever going to walk on somebody or in front of their cameras. But um, we just kind of took – spread some out just to kind of see what we're working with off the bat. And, man, that joker was – he come out right off the bat, and then it was like he didn't appear again forever on the camera. And then um, – 
We started getting some pictures of him deep down in some of them hollers out there, especially when the management area hunts were going on. It seems like I would get him more deeper in the hollers whenever those hunts were happening. Um, That's another thing. With your hunting club being so close to the management area, what percentage would you say of your shooters would get shot versus new deer showing up? Like we'd have like well that one fifty five ten, you know that I was telling you that the guest shot. Um, that was during a management area hunt, and I I really wish I could say that I'd seen that deer before, but whenever I grabbed it to help him drag it out was the first time I'd ever lay eyes on it. I had no idea, you know, that that was even close to there. You think it got pushed on the club by most the pressure? Most likely, most likely. Ooh, interesting. Mm. Mo- I mean, the spot where that is um, from the management area where it got shot is probably – uh, what's the legal distance you can hunt from the property line? You can hunt on it. Yeah, yeah. The property line is not a problem. It's like roadways and stuff like that. Okay, well then he was real close to the line, you mm-hmm. know, on being management. But, yeah. I mean, we had a shooting house set up. I mean, everything was legit. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, it did. It comes straight off the management area. I mean, and we had never, ever seen that deer. Didn't know it was in the world. Well, and that, I mean, that kind of goes back to the whole idea of, like, finding specific bucks. Because you never know when other bucks could pop up. But, like, the guy that's, like, listening or watching this episode that's, like, you know, he's had an encounter. Maybe he's got some trail camera, uh, you know, photos of a deer that he's, like, really keen in trying to hunt. But he's not taking the notes and building any kind of, like, back catalog of mm-hmm. what the deer's doing. What is, like, your stepping stones of, like, you know, your running cameras? And, again, whether there's travel, you know, crossings, food plots, um, you know, I'm sure you'd put some on scrapes, all that kind of stuff, just to try to get inventory. But once you find that specific deer, and to say, you know, whether it's, you know, before deer season comes in, but especially, like, during season, if, like, one buck sh- shows up, is there any, like, method to the madness of how you go about backtracking that deer? Uh, yeah, I usually will, um, whatever camera I had him on, that camera don't get taken off that tree. I'll start rotating other cameras around that camera, you know. And if I'm still getting him on that one camera, there's no way I'm touching it. I'm not even wanting to go in there and mess anything up, you mm-hmm. know. As long as that camera's got good batteries, you know, and it's still sending me pictures of him every day or two, you know, maybe three days, I know he's still using that area. So then I'm trying to take the ones outside that one and kind of hone in on which way he's coming, you know, mm-hmm. and then put the pattern together with those other cameras but as long as he's still coming to that one i don't move it and then if i start getting him on another camera that consistent that camera don't get touched i'll start taking other cameras and moving them until i'm basically drawing a line with cameras that i know i'm getting him on you know those cameras don't get touched if he starts being consistent. Mm-hmm. You're talking about getting him like every day to three days. That's like your criteria for whether or not you're. Drawing. Yeah, I mean, in, the, in this seven um, that we just shot, it uh, it disappeared a little over a week on us. I mean, I'm ready to tell myself, let's let's go gather up my stuff. He must have got shot, you know, on the over on the public land, but and then he showed back up. What? What are you putting your can? I've never had a deer that consistent. Like for wherever I, I'm, which I'm usually putting cameras on scrapes and stuff, and and sometimes trails. But like, are you on a food sort? Like, no. What do you have your camera on where he's on it? Like every one to three days, that consistently. Very close to his bed. Okay. The oh. old, the the older deer, five plus years. They're almost as consistent as a doe is. I mean. I think the older they are, the easier they are to track. Mm-hmm. Now, how he comes and goes to his bed, you know, the that's the, every deer is different. They all have their same personalities. They're not the same, but they all have a different personality. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, so one might be a whole lot careless than the next. Mm. Well, so, like, are you – I mean, are you, like, up in a pine thicket with your cameras? Like, on a trail in a pine thicket or something? Um, usually not in the pine thickets. Um, the edges, the edges, you know, um, within a, you know, 20, 30 feet or so, maybe inside of a pine thicket, mm-hmm. but not just 
dead square off in the middle of one. Yeah, they're in there. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. but I, I seem to get them a little more consistent out there on those edges because I mean, I almost feel like they they walk them edges just to smell. You know, not necessarily if if they could go over doe trails, you know, they'll know what all's been in there. Um, if they could just step over their trail and get a whiff of it, you know, so they kind of just combing the outside reins of it. Is that is that a uh, consistent, you know, outside of the rut too, or man, the rut? You you might well throw everything out the window. Okay. I mean, I did get this one the other day, and it was considered the rut here, but um, he was headed to his bed that he sleeps in majority of the time. So so you're saying like even like pre rut, they're they're more running the edges of the pine thickets, kind of still cutting trails even though it's not the rut you think that's just yeah because he's kind of like a loner you know he's not like with all the does and everything he's kind of doing his own thing yeah yeah the older ones uh, no doubt i mean i'll have cameras that you know all you two and three year olds you know they'll be one after the other and then i'll have one camera over here that here comes the oldie through there and then he's gonna be the only one you know he's yeah, I, he does travel with bachelor groups during that time frame, but I think once they get their velvet off, you know, he just more likely stays to himself. Do you ever get them on, like, community scrapes or anything? Like, I know you get them on camera cruising the edges and going to their bed and stuff, but, like, I got when I got pictures of the deer, he was like what you were saying, like cruising the edge of a pine thicket. Mm-hmm. And the only reason I even had cameras in there is because I saw him. So... I probably would have never got a picture of him hunting my normal scrapes, um, especially where the big scrape is in there, because I put a camera on a scrape in there and would have deer coming through like clockwork, but I never had him. He was always the, away from it. I I like community scrapes. You get a good idea of what's in there, but to me, um, I don't usually get the bigger ones on the community scrapes. They're, I mean, they're usually, if I get them on a scrape, that, that scrape's not much bigger than a pizza box. Ooh, I got some questions about that. <laughs> we, we got this big thing where we're, uh, we're I've been hunting a different uh, piece of public land over these last two years now. And the reason I'm going to this piece of public specifically is because it, like, it's known for, like, really, really big deer. And... My whole tactic out there has been I found these, I mean, ridiculous community scrapes, like way bigger than this table right here. It's like three of these tables stacked with each other. And uh, I took my stepdad in there. He's never seen good bucks. And we're trying to get him his first deer. And he saw that scrape and he was like, oh my gosh, like he'd never seen anything like it. And I found a couple of those in there, put cameras on them last year, got got like a bunch of good deer. But for the deer that I I know is in this area, like I'm not getting like the magnum bucks on that camera, and that's same thing this year. Like a bunch of good deer, like several deer I'd shoot, but not like just that that big big buck, you know. So you're saying that that you're getting the bigger ones on just like a is like, you think yep. it's like his personal scrape yep. or something? I mean, it's just like it, the ones that look like a deer walked through there and just hit it one time and kind of went on, you know, those kind. That's not, I mean. I know for a fact we got a community scrape over on our club that's down in the holler, and um, we put a camera on it, I guess, a few weeks ago now. And we're kind of having the same bucks coming down there to check it, knowing that we've got a probably a high teens, a 120 buck that's going from this holler or this ridge top down in this holler to this ridge top. We know he's traveling. We got proof he's traveling. And this ain't, it's within 150 yards of this scrape that we're talking about. He's never, ever been on that camera. He's never hit that community scrape. And he's within 100 to 150 yards. He just does his own thing, goes down, comes back up. He's never been over there. I mean, we got him on each side of the hill, you know. Time frame here, time frame there. He had enough time to walk through that holler and back up to the next one. He's he's yet to go. He's still not been over there. That actually excites me, man. That uh, I've actually I put a bunch of cameras out the other day and I put some on community scrapes, but I found one scrape 
in between these two thickets where there's like a little rub line coming down the edge of this thicket and there's one scrape there that's like small like what you're talking about on a faint trail and i was like i'm just gonna put a camera on it but now now i actually am like kind of hopeful for that camera <laughs> that sounds like i would spot. i mean give it a few days if not a week or so hey if nothing shows up time to move on down I, I don't put all your eggs in that basket with that think, big community scrape do you yeah. think it's one of those things that maybe those bucks like those uh better bucks more mature bucks they might not be working those community crates, so they might just be scent checking them from a longer distance, and they just don't care about actually interacting with them. I've kind of wondered that myself. I mean, I'm with you there. I, that's a question. I, I bring that up because one of our buddies, Shane Parker, who's been on the podcast a whole bunch, he sees that with a lot of his scrapes where he calls a lot of them primary scrapes where you have a bunch of bucks and does using a specific scrape. And he's like, a lot of times I'll get all these does and young bucks check the scrape, but he puts – he runs like 200 trail cameras, 250 trail cameras. So That'd ima- a imagine that, notebook, imagine right? that battery <laughs> bill. But what he does is he'll put like one camera on that scrape, but he'll put three facing away from the scrape, maybe 50, 60, yes. 70, 100 yards away. And it's more often than not, he always catches that bit, like the really big buck on one of those cameras, 100 yards, 50 to 100 yards away from the, ca- the scrape downwind. He's scent checking, but he's not going to that scrape. And he's like, and that's how we. I kind of have felt with some of our cameras uh, on this piece of public on these big community scrapes is a buck could scent check because the topography mm-hmm. from so far away, he doesn't have to come and work it if he doesn't want to. Um, and it makes you wonder, like, how often are those bucks just getting way around that, scent checking it, and then kind of keep on moving. But then they have their smaller scrapes, maybe a little bit closer to their beds or the areas that they really like to frequent that they'll just kind of touch, but it's, nothing else is really working those scrapes. Exactly. I mean, I, I honestly believe that deer that we're talking about um, that's, that's going from one ridge to the next one and hadn't been, I think he's just traveling just far enough to where he knows what's going on over there. Mm-hmm. He don't have to go over and make a scene, you know. It, when the right doe comes along at the right time, then he'll tender. Mm-hmm. Um, he ain't got to go over and do all that work. I mean, I know, I know for a fact them little bucks are going to do two, three, four times as much as works them old bucks are going to trying to get you know a doe bread interesting and that makes me wonder now after kind of thinking about that i just by the way i just now noticed you got a ton of multi mobile cell camera boxes sitting up there god man how many, so you said you're running like 20 what 23 24 cameras 25 cameras well, lost cam? <laughs> cell cams uh, i think i'm running eight of those and uh-huh. rest are sd because you know you can't take every cell cam down in the hollers because there's uh-huh. not much service around no. here you still got to hang on to them you know just for backup but, um, yeah, big fan of Moultrie. Well, so going back to the kind of the backtracking aspect, there's a lot of what you're doing that also reminds me of Josh Driver's episode. I think we reposted episode 510. Uh, 512. 512. 510's Rick. Oh, yeah, I keep, I keep saying that. Yeah, sorry, Rick. That was a great episode. Uh, but 512, and um, Josh does a lot of the same things that you're talking about. Like, you know, once he gets that one buck on camera, you know, in a specific location, he's not moving that camera as long as it's staying consistent. Right. And he's kind of fingering the area, you know, within a couple hundred yards around there, trying to find that path of travel and then kind of, you know, backtrack him a little bit closer to where he thinks he's in a more killable location. Because mm-hmm. just because you got him on camera there, it might be during daylight, but it might not be a huntable spot because you can't get in there clean. You know, if you get in there, you might blow over deer out or, you know, the timing he's coming in there might be tough for you to get in or get out. Mm-hmm. Um, and that all plays a factor for it. But what else about, like, get, building consistency – like plays a factor for you. You talked about this notepad, these notebooks that you use to kind of organize everything. What all do you put in that notebook based off when you're getting data, like trail cam photos from a specific deer? Like, are you checking like wind conditions, wind direction, all that kind of stuff? Like what goes in that notebook every time you get an image of them? I I, I used to keep up with the wind and stuff. I mean, but then that's just a lot of writing, you know? <laughs> so now I, I'm getting more, just date and time and the area, okay? Mm-hmm. And then say, on this day, you know, he was over here. And then some, sometimes the moon, you know, mm-hmm. we ain't going to go real deep with that. <laughs> but um, I, I will do kind of keep up with that, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, more so of I'm trying to find his path, you know, and they don't take the same path. Um, but if I can kind of get it on a map to where I'm drawing that oval or that circle, you know, and it's never going to be consistent, but they're going to be in and out. But um, the older ones seem to keep that pattern more um, as far as 
like this old guy I killed the other day, you know, he was, uh, he wasn't going to bed at nine o'clock that morning. And that's the second or third time though, that he's come through there at that time. And not, not for anything else. I mean, I guess he's out browsing, maybe taking a nap or so and then getting up and then going into the privet bushes to lay down for the day, you know, the rest of the day. But, um, that was more of a feeling like mm -hmm. that was a gut check there. I, I need to go hunt that spot for some reason, you know, that morning. Um, I, I hunted that deer four times or that was the fourth time last year. Um, from the data that I had, uh, the graveyard buck, uh, I hunted him once and we got him shot the first time. Uh, turkey foot deer was, uh, I went in to hunt him twice mm -hmm. and got him shot on a second hunt. Like I, I told my wife when, we when I left the house, you know, it was, it's time to go kill that buck, you know, that turkey foot deer. She was like, oh, okay, good luck, whatever, you know. <laughs> a little while later, here we come back. Um, I'm, I made myself start sitting longer in the mornings, but, man, I, I'm, I'm not a fan of getting out there early in the evenings. I push my luck with it. I, a lot of people in the hunting club really don't like it. I'm the kind that I will purposely wait till 4 o'clock. If you ever notice, now, during the rut, you can hunt all day long. Mm -hmm. You're just so unpredictable. But I've had better experiences and see more bigger bucks when I wait. And then on a good day, you're going to have a nice little breeze. Everybody knows when that sun goes over those treetops, it calms down for a little while. Then you're going to usually feel that wind come back the other way. I feel like if I'm out there before all that happens, I'm just marinating all those woods with my scent. And then at that switch, you know, everything I've been sitting there for is going to blow right back the opposite way. Mm -hmm. um, so if I can time it just right on... You know, getting there about that sun over the treetops and slip in there where I need to be kind of before they start moving. You know, I've been busted a lot, but in the afternoons, I see bigger bucks waiting, if that makes any sense. That does make sense. So just, I mean, slipping in there like right, right at prime time, really. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's been e evenings where... I knew somebody was going to hunt a certain spot, so I had to get on in there so I don't go driving past them. Mm -hmm. But when I got to my area, I have sat in my truck and waited till 4 o'clock and then got out and walked in there, and there it was. Got him done. Do you kill bigger bucks in the evening or in the morning? Doing it. Man, oh. this is about 50-50. Up until about three or four years ago, it was evening times. That's I mean, weird it, for around here. Yeah, yeah, I, I know it. I super know it. Weird. I, know it. I, I, I'm, I love clear cuts. You know, I'm usually the one if I'm on a WMA, I'm finding the clear cut. And afternoons has just been a sweet, unless it's a good frosty morning. If it's a frosty morning, I'm on a clear cut. But I, any day of the week, I'd rather be on a clear cut in the afternoons. I'm I'm a little bit I this is I mean this is kind of like specific to us but some people all over the place can kind of relate to it most likely around here it's it's really thick a lot of pine plantations just thick pine country uh like everybody I know out here I swear struggles in the evenings yeah. like a lot of people kill deer in the morning a lot of people kill bucks in the morning mm -hmm. But a lot of people struggle in the evening, and you even see the people like all over Facebook talking about it. They're mm -hmm. like, "Man, what is the deal with such and such with with the evening hunts? Why do you think that is?" Just out of curiosity. I, 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 they might be getting out there too early. <laughs> <laughs> They're marinating the woods, man, with all their sense. Um, I, I don't, I don't know. To me, it's easier seeing deer in the afternoons than it is in the mornings. You know. Also, too, by the way, on on your thoughts on slipping in late, I know I know other people who do that, like especially like other people across the country, like Paul does that, mm -hmm. where you're kind of especially 
I mean, this is hill country around here. It's, it can be really hard to predict the wind. And mm-hmm. so kind of letting it die down and then slipping in there, like that does make a lot of sense. Like you got to be, a, like I'm assuming you probably know that the tree you're getting in or you have a preset, you know, set up that you can get in really quickly. Uh, but like Paul talks about that all the time where he, he'll wait for like the thermals to switch. He'll, yeah. he'll wait for the day yep. winds to die down. And yep. then he goes like, he, Paul's even talked about, he might walk, you know, most of the way to a stand and like be like one hill back or something. Mm-hmm. And then when that happens, then just pop over yep. the hill and get right where he needs to go, like right there at prime time. I mean, that does make a lot of sense to me because when you think about it that way, it's less time for something to go wrong for that one wind swirl to happen, yep. you know, where he, he catches a whiff of something. He's like, eh, nope, I'm going this way. Yep, I, I agree 100%. I mean, that's that's right up my alley right there. there. Um, also, I, I feel like in the evenings, they're more predictable in the evenings to me. Once that sun goes over those trees, you know it's prime. I mean, that's when the deer is going to be getting up out of their bed. And the mornings are just like drawn out. You know, it's like in the evening, it's like a countdown. You're waiting. The mornings, it's just like, is this going to be a good day or not a good day? You know, and you're not really waiting for a time, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. It's just, I, see, and I'm. I'm wanting to try to learn to have more confidence in the evening because I've killed most of my deer in the mornings. And I'm like, on a morning sit, I always think it's going to, like, each hour, potentially, especially on the rest, going to get better and better. And the evening sit, I'm like, the way I look at the countdown, I'm like, crap, I only got 20 minutes left. I only got 10 mm-hmm. minutes left. Oh, crap, <laughs> I can barely see. And I'm like, you know, is the deer going to pop out? And I'm like, crap. And like, I don't know. It's like, but a lot of the guys I know that kill a lot of mature bucks, especially down here in the southeast, have a lot of the same thought process in the evenings. It's like, you know, you got to put yourself in the right position, but it's like when you're hunting, it's different when you're hunting a specific deer versus if you're just hunting like mature bucks in general. Like I'm just trying to find a mature buck and you're just kind of like throwing dart at the map. Like, you know, I know this area is pretty good, but I'm just going to go sit it and see how it does versus like, hey, I've got images of this deer. I have an idea of how this deer is using this area. To me, that I, I can see how that could potentially give you more confidence as well, especially on an evening sit. Well, I know he's bedded in this general area. Say it's a clear cut. He's bedded in this general area. If I can get in there again, that last 30, 45 minutes, hour of daylight, slip up a tree, you know, potentially can get an opportunity at him when he stands up and kind of moves around. That I mean, that's exactly right. Um, I was just telling uh, you know, my partner Bub over there today that uh, we. We spend a lot more time walking, honestly, and a lot of we go hunting in the evenings, but we're scouting, we're walking, we're wearing it out, and then we'll kind of ease our way in the direction we need to be going, like you was just saying, and mm-hmm. then that last hour or so, you know, when it to me really counts is okay. It's like we'll go over and sit down, and we'll, let's get serious, you know, and and go at it that way. But I. I don't even remember your original question about all that. No, I mean, uh, really wasn't even a question, more of just a statement. Of, like, when you have, like, especially history with a specific deer in a specific area and you're hunting, like, that specific buck and kind of understanding his patterns, that how a morning sit or afternoon sit, you know he's probably already in there versus a morning sit. You know, to me, if you're going mm-hmm. in the morning, he may be already back at the bed and he's done for the day, or he may be coming back later and I'll get an opportunity. But in the evening – as long as something hasn't bumped him out of that general bedding yep. area, he's probably still in there. And I, I can see that's what I'm saying. Yep. As a guy that hunts specific bucks, how that would give you more confidence and probably even lend yourself to, like, put yourself in the right position for a morning sit that, you know, am I bumping him on the way into the tree? Am I, you know, is he already in his bed by the time I get set up in the dark? Or is he going to come by at 8 o'clock in the morning because he's coming back late to his bed? That's exactly how we did that. I mean, that was a lot of that had to do with trail cam footage. You know, mm-hmm. I knew he was... I didn't know exactly where he laid down, but I could give you a two or three acre, you know, estimate there. And I took my chances, you know, because I do know he he never laid in the same bed every time. You know, he was kind of every third or fourth day he would be here. And then, I mean, he had, he had beds all over, you know, on this side of a highway, on that side of a highway. And. But I knew he was in that area on that day. So, do you ever walk in and actually try to find some of the beds they're actually using? 
like a specific buck, or is it more just knowing the, the area that he likes nah. to bed in? Have you ever walked up on a bedded buck here in Alabama? No, they, they, they jump up so far away, you don't know what it Have was. Have you ever seen a physical bed and knew a buck laid there? Assumed, but not confirmed. There you go. Yeah. Same <laughs> way, same way. Okay. I mean, I, I've jumped bucks up, you know, and seen where they left from, but I've never been able to walk up on one. I've, mm-hmm. I've tried, man. It, you, well, you hear a lot of guys in the Midwest, and it's funny you bring that up because you hear a lot of guys in the Midwest, oh, man, I jumped a buck up, I saw him, saw he's a shearer, I'm going to go and hunt him. You don't get the opportunity to because <laughs> no. it's so thick and dense. And we've talked about I'll, the I'll hear people t- say, like, yeah, I jumped a buck, like what we're talking about. I hear people say that all the time. But when, if you start asking them questions, they're like, well, I jumped a like I didn't see him, but you know it was on the point. You know he was uh, he was over here. I, f- I found the bed. I'm assuming it was a buck. I'm like, man, you don't know. Whenever I refer to I'm going to go hunt him in his bed, that's not meaning like something the size of a twin size mattress. That's something that's usually an acre or two. Mm-hmm. You know that's what I'm calling his bed, mm-hmm. bedroom, bed area, whatever you want to call it, but. Um, yeah, it, I've never I've never keyed one in that close before, um, but it, he does switch areas, you know, like he did every third and fourth day, mm-hmm. you know, or sometimes it might be five or six, depending on if he didn't want to lay there two, three times, then he might go on to his next one, but there, I can't pinpoint him that close. What what else has been factors for you for? <clears throat> building history with a specific deer as in like what else kind of comes about like typically is it like the first year you you find a buck that you maybe get an opportunity at him or is it like you're talking about potentially even multiple years before you actually get a chance to shoot that deer usually i i'll have about two years worth on him Mm -hmm. um my number one this year has already gotten shot by another member sorry eric 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 went that morning and said, I'm going to this particular spot to shoot a, a doe, go ahead and get my doe out of the way, and he ended up wiping out my number one. <laughs> yeah, on a doe hunt, and that was great. <laughs> I, man, mm. I sure appreciate that. Let me know if y'all ever need a guest over there, by the way. Yeah, you're talking about a, a guest killed a 150, a 128, or whatever. I'm like, can I be a guest? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a pretty cool place. <laughs> and, and, you know, a deer really don't have to be super big to be a, um, my hit lifter. I mean, if I got a year or two or more worth of footage of you, you know, me and you've become personal, you know. I'm, I am I want you, if, if this deer that he shot, it was, I mean, it was just an eight point, but, you know, it was a five by three and, mm-hmm. I've I've got his sheds right over on that table, you know, for for two years worth. I wanted him since I've got his sheds, you know, for the past two years. L- let me ask you this, because uh, I was interested in asking this even before we started. What is the difference between building history and hunting a specific buck, say on y'all's club, versus on the public land and dealing with like you know you know typically how the guys hunt on the on the club. You know what the pressure is going to be like, but the public land it's can be completely different every single week, every single year. What's the difference between going back and forth between those places? Is there a different strategy in between it? Or, like, how do you approach both those places when it comes to, like, learning and hunting specific deer? Uh, really? The strategy? Uh, man, it's... The, the deer, without pressure, is going to almost act the same, in my opinion, private versus mm-hmm. the public. Um until them hunts come along, you know, and then they kind of get them stirred up and get them a little off kilter, but that's that's kind of like the rut. You know, when them hunts, a lot of times, all the information I've gathered, I mean, it don't mean a whole lot because who's to say Jim Bob over there just didn't walk out through the middle and bump him out and bumped him so far that it got him off pattern, you mm-hmm. know. So the hunts really messed that part of the process up Mm -hmm. you know far as the data but um it's those like we just come off of um about two weeks worth of of no rifle hunting you know big rifle hunting Mm -hmm. um so you know you can kind of get back in the rhythm little thing and kind of get yourself prepared for this upcoming one you know um versus the club you know it kind of stays the same 
I mean, to me, I like to get deer used to what I'm doing, you know. I don't try to go to no extremes. They will pattern you too, you know. Mm -hmm. Like, to the point where if you're trying to slip in, a lot of times you bust them. But if you get them used to you, in a way, like, man, honestly, some of the bigger deer I've killed has been right behind people's houses. To me, I don't feel like I have to worry so much about covering my sin and this and that because they're bedding in their backyard somewhere, you know, right across their barbed bar fence. They're hearing noises all day. They're smelling grandma walk outside with all of her perfume on. You know, they're kind of, they know they're bedding right there. They, that's nothing new to them, you know. It's, it makes, it honestly makes hunting those deer that live Pine in people's houses and stuff so much easier than going way deep off in there and you're kind of letting them deer see or smell something that they've never smelled before. Well, and that's also the thing is like if you have a deer, say that you're building some history with and you're like, I, I definitely want to try to target this deer and you have like some of these gun hunts that pop up, you know, you're dealing with other hunters that, you know, maybe somebody has that deer on camera and maybe they're just randomly want to go hunt that general area, that spot. Is there a strategy to, like, is that one of those things that, hey, I'm going to get out there at 3 a.m. and have my truck parked there? Or? Man, I'm the last one that's going to get out there at 3 a.m. I can't do it. <laughs> I can't do it. I, I'm Nine times out of ten, I'm a little after gray light going in. Mm -hmm. um, I can confirm that. This day, <laughs> I, most of the time, I'm leaving before the light's even on at the house. <laughs> I'll be out there at the gate. Before the birds even think about waking up, and he's both waking them, up. Both of them sitting in the driveway, like, man, will you hurry up? Come on, it's, it's, I, I gotta go. I gotta go. I'm like, man, y'all go on. I'll just catch up with you. Um, I'm, I'm not the 3 a.m. guy. That's usually when I'm getting my best sleep. And, Let me ask you this: four, I'm getting good. Is it one of those things then when you're finding specific bucks, are they in less obvious spots that probably won't have the pressure compared to like more obvious locations? So, like, you don't have to necessarily get, be there super early? Is it one of those things that, like, if there's already a guy parked there, you have a general air, idea of where he's probably going to be at, and you'll kind of, you know, slip in the back door? There, yes. Um, <laughs> to which question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I really kind of forgot what you were talking about on the second question because that first one, you know. Okay. Kind of, um, so, less obvious spots. Well, we have a WMA that's south of here, mm -hmm. south of the one that's local. You know, within an hour or so range. To me, that one is so awesome because you can find pine thickets and there's going to be so many cars piled at this gate. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, yeah, let's let's look at this map and zoom out. It's like, where is those deer going to go, you know? I mean, me and my dad and my uncle, we've been doing it for years and years. And we go around the closest way you can get to the backside of that thicket. And it, it, people start figuring it I mean, they're going to drive them deer, and then all of a sudden they're going to get to them pinch points and stuff where they're going to be shooting across, and that's where you want to be. I mean, I've that particular place we're talking about, I've got um, I've got six deer mounted mm -hmm. that has come out of the same tree. Oh. <laughs> Not the same at the same tree. There's, there's like some, a lot of brass down there <laughs> at the base of it. <laughs> um, there with the metal detector, fine Jonathan spot. <laughs> my, uh, my, my son's killed one there. Um, man, there, there's a lot of deer on the wall that come from that one because of other hunters. So you're straight up just hunting, I, hunting yeah, pressure. Hell yeah. Down there, it's, man, it. I, we go to that spot like, man, I hope there's a lot of hunters out today. Yeah, that's going to be a good one if there is. Man, what's that process look like? So in that situation, are you hunting mornings or are you hunting evenings in that spot? Um, that particular spot, uh, man, I don't hardly ever see nothing in the evenings down there. Mm -hmm. Really? Because they're, they're already been pushed out. Yeah, right? I guess. I mean, they're just trying to survive at that point. Um, but in the mornings, it's, man, 90% of the time – we do better, way better in the mornings. So uh, the reason I ask, I'm curious. I'm, I'm assuming it's kind of like what you just described, where there's a pine thicket or something that's holding deer that they're bedding in. People are coming in the top side. You're going around the back side. Are you getting in before daylight and and killing deer right at daylight? Because I'm nah. assuming those guys are probably coming in, you know, before daylight or at gray light. And so I'm wondering 
how long does it take for those deer to finally squirt out the backside? It, it's, it's, it's different every time. Um, I, man, like I said, I'm hardly ever in the woods before daylight, ever. Um, and it's mainly just laziness. <laughs> I mean, that's <laughs> honestly it. <laughs> I mean, um, I, I like to take my time. I, I'm not a speed walker by no means. I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna walk a couple steps and stop. We're gonna look around, and I'm gonna listen to see if those steps may have ran something off. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like I'm listening to the woods, and then take a few more steps, and then I just stop and listen, and kind of just, or if I do keep walking, it's soft enough to where I can kind of I know what's going on around me at all times versus speed walking. And um, how do you make yourself do that? Because like. I can't physically make myself do that. I'll sit there, I'll go slow, but then I'm sitting there watching where I'm stepping, and before I know it, I'm going slow, slow, slow. There he goes. He jumped up right right. if I'd have just been looking. You know, he was 30 yards from me because I'm sitting there going slow, making no noise, but I'm not looking. I can't make myself slow down, so I just said the heck with it. Now I just... Walk like normal. I don't even care. If I jump him up, I jump him up, you know. I'm going to do it anyway. I'll be down on the other end of that thicket. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It's like, Baxley, where where are you sitting this morning? All right, cool. I'm going to be 30, 400 yards behind him. Yeah, I mean, I I, I really do. I mean, I I feel like I'm hunting as soon as I start walking. Like, I, I don't care if I get to the spot I wanted to start, you know, to go to. I'm hunting... Uh, hell, I'm hunting when we go to the grocery store. I'm always looking for deer, but as soon as I get out there with the gun or bow or whatever, I'm almost prepared. I'm always carrying a shooting stick. Like, I'm wanting it to happen right then. I mean, the quicker the better. You know, if I get there and have to sit all day, that's fine. But, hey, man, if I can go ahead and bust him as I'm going in, that's what I'm looking for. It really is. Interesting. So going back to that, the when you're hunting, the hunting pressure. You said that they, it, it's like all different times of the morning. So I mean, th- is there is there any consistency? Because I'm just wondering, like, okay, if there's a bunch of dudes stacked up on the the edge of this thicket and the deer know that they're there, like, what is their talk? Because a guy we've had on in the past, Wes Moe, he hunts where you're talking about, and he does the same thing, and he's killed a bunch of big deer doing that. But he does it with his own guys. But he does it with it. He, he'll do it with other people too. But he brings his own. Hit, like we've gone on a couple. There'll be fifteen I've ki- of us I've there. Killed a buck. Yeah, he killed morning. a nice buck down yeah. there doing that. Uh, there was like twelve of us that morning, or I don't think I was there that no, morning. Was yeah, like I was six. there the next morning. There was like there was twelve of us, and we just all kind of get around, get around like a thicket, and do what you're talking about. Mm. And the way Wes describes it, he's like, man, like sometimes there'll be a buck in there. And somebody's wind is blowing, like, right at that thing, you know, for four hours. And then finally, eventually, it'll get up and, like, go the other way or something. And so, I guess, like he was saying, it's not super consistent. So, I'm just wondering if you've seen the same thing. The one thing I ever see consistent really about that, especially that area down there. Um, this one up here is a little different. But um, that one down there, I always start hearing gunshots about 7 o'clock on the money. You can start counting gunshots. <laughs> and then um, between 8 and 8.30, for some reason, the deer seem to be more in panic mode by then. I don't know if it's just from all the gunshots, but people getting down and walking around. I don't, I don't know. But 8, 8.30, 9 o'clock is a sweet spot for me down there. Okay. What about, a, what about and not even just with the hunting pressure thing, but, just normal hunting, like, do you, have you had a lot of luck midday? Uh, I have not killed a lot of deer during midday. I'm normally walking and scouting. I have seen a, or I have jumped up a lot of deer during, I mean, yeah, I've seen a lot of deer midday. Um, I'm normally walking, I, I mean, and there it kind of contradicts what I was saying a while ago, but by midday you know it's kind of i don't expect it as much as early in the mornings and late in the evening so um i i would if 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 i could sit in a spot all day long um 
I have done that south of here. And the bigger deer, one of the biggest deer I've ever seen on that was about 12 o'clock. Okay, interesting. And then also, you keep mentioning you're always scouting. And even before we started recording, you were talking about how much you're walking and, and you're just constantly walking instead of hunting. And with how much history you have with this place especially, are you... I'm assuming you're rescouting stuff that you're already really familiar oh, yeah. with. Oh yeah. So, um, so you're rewalking areas that you have years of history with. Mm-hmm. Yep. So what's the what's the thought process behind that? Just I just mean, staying up to date. Yeah. It, there seem to be on on a pattern where. I, let me say the I don't know if it's even got anything remotely to do with what you just asked me, but a deer like to walk property lines. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. They don't really. That could be two stages. I mean, this could have been cut, and this can be mm-hmm. cut. But a deer still likes to walk a property line for some reason. And you can go and clear cut something, and then within a few years, mm-hmm. the deer are still going to be traveling kind of that same edge, almost edge, you know, up and down on them hills, mm-hmm. you know, might be a quarter of the way up or whatever, no matter what the trees look like around and i mean you kind of get to where historically you know you, all, all your history right there mm-hmm. in that area like you might not see a deer there all bow season but come the first week of december according to my cameras and taxidermy bill this right here has <laughs> been a pretty good spot so i'm gonna go back and bam there it is again you know yeah they, they just tend to go back to the same areas you know that's what I've experienced. I, yeah, I will, man. I will. I, I will scout at least two or three times a year, you know, in some of the areas that I've killed deer at before. I'll go back and revisit them. What, what are you looking for? Are you, are you just confirming they're still using it? Are you, you're looking for that sign? Just for activity, you know, deer activity in there. I mean, rather, it's, it, it don't have to be rubs, scrapes, nothing, you know. Mm-hmm. If I can tell that, Two or three weeks ago, I was out here and wasn't much activity going on, which would have been normal. Now I'm in here and these trails were beat down, and I was like, "Okay, it's time to hunt this right now." Okay. Like, like not this weekend, like this afternoon. Okay. Sometimes I, I won't even come out. You know, I'll just end up sitting there. Yeah, and and that kind of you kind of got got into it a little bit there. But another thing I wanted to ask about was kind of going back to earlier in the podcast. When I was asking about your uh, your hunting club and how it's been cut, and you kind of hunted that timber cycle, well, when you like incorporate the management area, you got whatever you want to hunt. Like it's so diverse, you could go hunt a fresh clear cut, a two year old, three year old, four year old, like you know whatever you want because it's all out there. Um, with with how the habitat changes mm-hmm. so much, and especially where we live, I mean, it's like a completely different landscape every three years. Mm-hmm. Every three years, it is completely different than it was. So you're constantly having to evolve. Uh, do you just kind of seek out the same stuff year to year, habitat wise? Like you're like, oh man, this like one, th- this age of pines works really well for me. Oh, this this kind of hardwood works out for me. Like, what's that look like for you? Yeah. I I do tend to lean towards more certain things than others. Like, um, for example, last year we um, we was going in late one day and some people had done took in our spot, so we kind of had to go to plan B, C, D, and all that and going down. And, and we ended up going to a place where I told Bub over there, I said, man, this the equipment was still sitting out there where they're cutting this thing. I'm like, man, I've never hunted this fresh of a clear Mm. cut the fuel truck still sitting out there leaking fuel you know down through the ground and all um we get out of the truck the gate and we walk around this equipment and literally the fuel truck was sitting there leaking fuel that's that's no exaggeration um as soon as we passed by the front bumper about 30 yards some whole herd of does jumped up ran off and (laughs) all that equipment i wouldn't have never but we was out of time, you know, in the day. We had to do something. It was either do something or go home. Sure, let's go. And, man, that that blew my mind, you know. I know they don't mind equipment, but just just sitting out there. Yeah. It's now, that, what's funny, uh, one of uh, the guys that's been on the podcast before, uh, Ben George, he just killed a big buck down here um, 
for this past week, and uh, he's mentioned this in some of the clubs he's been in the past. The same thing when guys come in log, he's like, "Dude, I'm there." He's like, "They can have the equipment out there." He's like, "If the guys are cutting, as long as I can hunt and be in a safe area from them and me." He's like, dude, those bucks will come right through there, no problem at all. And he, he's talked about killing some really big deer um, where, like, they start on a clear cut on one section, they're done with it, but now they're, like, just next to it, you know, 300 yards away, still cutting, sitting in this section. They just cut it yesterday and having bucks cruise through, you know, through the wide open, around the brush tops and everything, and, and killing a really big deer doing yeah, that. Absolutely, absolutely. That's one of the things I do, you know, during the summertime is is uh, I run a skid steer with a mulcher or, mm-hmm. or a cutter on the front, and – um, I've done gas line work and stuff, and, it, and it's, I can't tell you how many times, you know, I, it's kind of like a, a long, one of them gas lines, it's, it's a long stretch, and then you could make one pass down, mm-hmm. it might be two or three hills, and then come back two or three, kind of like mowing your yard, mm-hmm. except a little longer. And I'll come back over this hill, and there's a whole herd of deer standing there. And Eat I've only and cut. I've only been gone 45 seconds, you know. Mm-hmm. And then I go back over that hill, and then of course they might run off in the woods a little bit, and then turn around and come back, and there they are again, you know, time and time again. That does not affect them at all, but they they do love all that fresh stuff, man. They they'll, they'll be right out there, and it, as long as you keep producing it, they'll keep coming back. Um. I don't know if I've ever seen no great big deer that do that, but mm-hmm. man, them does and them yearlings, two year olds, they'll they'll wear you out. I talked to a logger. I've seen him like every day this week. He said, "He's like, I'm gonna start calling you my Ken." I said, "Because <laughs> <laughs> I've seen him every day this week. I love him to death. I don't even know his name, but I love him. But I'm gonna start calling you my Ken. I love him. <laughs> and um, he's out there in the cutter this week, and I hear him." fired up and wham, wham, cutting them trees <laughs> he said man there's a big old nanny out there following me around in a skitter <laughs> I'd, dra- I'd drag him trees 100 yards or something down she'd run over there to that pile and eat every bit of it yeah. <laughs> I like this guy already I love him he gave me a ride out no. there, there you go he gave yeah. you a ride out he gave me a ride out on the skitter or on, a, on, on his, his truck, truck. on oh, his okay. truck yeah I'm he like, gave me a ride like, out man, on his he truck he fuel for you then Oh, that's hilarious. But, no. yeah, they, as soon as they cut it, he said, them deer run right over there, start eating. I'd drag it up the hill. They'd follow me up the hill and eat it right there at the pad. Oh, my gosh. Did you ask him if he's uh, been seeing any big ones? Yeah. <laughs> he, he <laughs> what did he say? He said he'd been seeing a big old spike. and um, I like a big old spike. <laughs> as long as it's an old one. <laughs> yeah. Well, he, he, he said he's been seeing some okay ones, nothing to write home about, which I, maybe he kills 200-inch deer and he's just – Actually, yeah, sleep off the skitter. Yeah, the <laughs> that or he's not. He's not gonna tell me so where that 130 inch spike ain't nothing to him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'd be all over that, man. Oh my gosh, I yeah. sure would. Yeah, man. So, so I got another question about tra- uh, going back to trail cameras and mm-hmm. uh, just as many cameras as you run over like the area that you run them and everything. Do you ever notice uh, deer preferring one type of cover? based on like weather conditions so like today it was windy as crap and i got blasted i sat on top of a hill like an idiot and dude it was like it was terrible do you like on a day like today do you see them like oh they're gonna get in some like dense pines down low or some dense cover down low to get out of that wind versus like maybe it's raining maybe Mm -hmm. they're they're wanting to be in some more open pines where they're not you know walking through a forest full of wet mops you know like like in some of that cover that's got a lot of broom sedge and stuff in it, I feel like they don't like to be in that in the rain because it, it's like walking yeah. through wet mops, you know, and they want to be in the more open. So I'm just wondering, have you picked up on anything, any kind of patterns like that over the years? Um, I, I do. Um, the rainy days um, is more so being in the hardwood bottom. You know, not I don't hunt open areas a whole lot, but... The rainy days, I've seen some pretty good bucks in, in bottoms and stuff, um, especially in the afternoons. I don't know, I don't really know why that is, but if mm-hmm. it's a rainy afternoon, I want to be in, in the bottoms. Um, real, real windy days, if you can see them moving, like today. Um, the only bucks I got today was was in pine thickets. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Um, on ridge tops in pine thickets. Um, 
I had a couple cameras with different bucks, and that was the only bucks I got today, and they were on in some, I don't know, 12, 14-foot tall pines, if that. Okay. Um, That's exactly what I hunted this afternoon. I yeah. should have brought some goggles with me. It was bad. <laughs> I was on the ridge top. There was nothing between me and the sky, man. I was on a I was on a ridge top cut over and I was just looking out across Alabama. I was way up there. <laughs> man, I'm a big old sissy when that wind starts blowing. I hate it, man. Oh, oh my gosh, I hate it. That's when that's when it's time to get down and start walking. Yep. I actually thought about that. I was looking at my I'm like, it's four twenty three. I got this much daylight left, but I decided to stick it out. <laughs> it was terrible. Yeah, I think the uh high wind conditions is like one of those times I have always struggled. I, I know guys, uh like our buddy Michael Perry, uh, who says he sees and gets opportunity a lot of times at really big deer in high wind situations, mm-hmm. but he's also hunting different habitat type compared to like where we're at. Um and you know, see him on the backside of the ridges kinda out of that wind, kinda cruising and all that kind of stuff. But to me, that's like one of the most challenging things, yeah. um, especially for someone that doesn't live in Kansas where, you know, we're not used to mm-hmm. 15, 20 mile an hour winds. When you get those mm-hmm. conditions, you're like, oh, I want to go sit in this spot. It'd be a good spot. And then you realize, oh, dude, I'm about to get pounded by wind for the next three and a half, four hours. Yeah, that was me today. Yeah, that, that was me yesterday. And I saw a doe. I had a doe come out 45 yards from me, uh, kind of go into a cut. Um, and then, I, dude, I had a, I'll, we'll get to talk about this on the outro episode. I had an armadillo. I'm talking about oh. get me good. Dude. Oh, I did too this, yesterday. I, this doe came out. This doe came out cross right into the clear cup, and all I saw, I'm like, I thought I heard something. Took my hood off because I'm getting pelted by wind, and all of a sudden I heard ch, ch, ch. like sound like <laughs> sound like sound like a buck scraping out, you know, making a scrape right behind me. And I, this little ridge behind me, I'm like, there, there's, I've seen a bunch of scrapes over there. And dude, I, I, t- I spin around real quick to my grunt call, do a couple <laughs> grunts, and then all of a sudden, after I do the grunts, it gets louder. It's like it sounds like ch, 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 ch. I'm like, oh, it's coming, dude! I had the gun ready, dude, and oh. everything. And then 15 yards out in front of me, forget that that armadillo falls out. I'm like, you're that, killing that me. That happened to me, but I did a doe bleep, man. I did like three. Do- I was like, eh. <laughs> did a couple of those, and then I heard it coming, and I'm like, get ready, and I'm like. I'm, like, going all over the tree, like, looking into this thick stuff because it was so thick he could have got past me. So I'm, like, looking, and then, like, I'm looking, like, 80 yards away, and then I notice, like, 30 yards in front of me is the freaking armadillo. (laughs) And he's, like, scratching around. I almost shot him. (laughs) I was about to say, (laughs) as a kid, I have smoked many of armadillos because of that. Open season. I mean, because you're so prepared and ready. Dude, nothing sounds more like a deer than an armadillo. That's exactly what I was going to (laughs) say. Nothing sounds more like a deer compared to an armadillo. And they can even sound like two and three deer at the same time. Dude, you you got one running off a ridge, dude, going through an SMZ, and it's like, shh. You're like, yeah. Oh God, dude! Like it's not coming, man. Chasing. <laughs> the next thing you know, it's a stupid armadillo pops up there. Kill it, man! I just I smoked that. Out. Just, <laughs> you put me through that ro- emotional roller coaster. You're yeah. getting hammered. Oh, that's exactly. I was like, dude, I'm, like, I'm I was thinking, I'm like, man, I'm about to tag out on this buck when he comes in. If he's a good one, I mean, we, we almost shot a beaver earlier because of that ourselves. <laughs> I got that on video. <laughs> oh my gosh! Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, that, it, 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 yeah. So sidetracked, but yeah, they, they got me so freaking tore up yesterday. But again, but in those high wind <laughs> situations, like, dude, it's just it's so challenging to hunt a lot of this kind of habitat. Um, and because, like, Andrew, you know, we've seen this too, kind of like what Jonathan's saying. You know, all those bucks are using those pine thickets in a lot of those cases where you know real high winds. But it's like, well, how the hell are you going to get a hold of one? It's mm-hmm. like you know. Get you get your road bay, get you some kind of you know spot you can kind of see, because if not, you know they're in stuff that's dense enough. Like you're not looking down into a lot of that kind of stuff, which makes it super mm. challenging. Um, yeah, that's kind of how it was this afternoon. I kind of took a chance because I was figuring like those like 14 ish foot tall pines, uh, like when you're standing there at the the tops of the pines are just whipping around. But if you look down at like a deer's level, it is like dead still mm-hmm. down there. Like the understory is completely still. And, like, there's briars and stuff all over and blackberries, and they're not moving at all. Yep. But, like, from seven feet up, it, everything's just whipping. Mm-hmm. And so I climbed, like, as high as I could go in this one tree, and I was trying to look down into it, but I just didn't see anything. So uh, on that same vein, the other thing I wanted to ask about was uh, temperature. So on, like, for instance, like on a – I mean, here in Alabama, like, it's really not uncommon – I'm not going to say I'm con. It's, it's pretty regular that at some point, like in December, we're going to have like a 70 degree day at some point. Uh, do you see them? Uh, do you see a big shift in pattern or just a just a drop in movement 
when that happens? Like, what's that look like for you? Uh, see, they're going to eat. I mean, they're like us. They're going to get up and eat. I want, I, I've always asked myself if, if they change up their patterns a little more. You know, yeah. they might go over here versus they've been going over here the past three days. But, yes, uh, there's a – I do see changes in the deer. Um, anytime, it, you know, I heard somebody say a while back, I think one of y'all shows it, about that 10-degree mark, you know, once mm-hmm. it jumps at 10 degrees. Um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan of that. Uh, anytime – it don't have to be cold, you know. If it warms up, I've I've seen deer move a lot whenever it warms up. Yeah. Um, versus being cold. That's 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 interesting. Uh, I, I've that's one of the next things I was going to ask about. We, a little TV on over here, and old what a, old JP Dice or uh huh. He's a, he's in the corner telling us that Tuesday morning it's going to be twenty one degrees. As long as that. So hope oh, that ain't the wind speed. Twenty. Yeah. So twenty twenty one <laughs> degrees. Here in Central Alabama, Tuesday morning. So I'm curious on on your perspective on that. I feel like on mornings like that, I don't see anything until like nine, nine ten yeah, o'clock. Yeah, exa- Yeah, that's the same thing I've seen. Exactly. That's so you sleep in a little bit those mornings. Hey man, I'll be the first on them frosty he's, he's mornings. Sleeping in anyways. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not necessarily sleeping, but you know, I'm gonna drag feet getting out there. Like in frosty mornings on them clear cuts, everybody's mm. in a rush to get out there. I'm like. I, I don't see too many deer out there eating frosty stuff, you know. It's always, it's, when that sun starts hitting the clear, it's like the deer, like, follow the sun down mm-hmm. through them cuts and stuff. You know what I mean? Mm. I'm like, I'm in no hurry until that sun is beaming right there. And then they're just, when you start seeing that glisten of horns come out because of the sun, <laughs> you know. that's a little bit of that. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to dream about that tonight. Yeah. Goodness. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, them frosty mornings on a clear cut, I wouldn't trade. There, there ain't nothing better than sitting at clear cut and you see like white shine of an antler move. Mm-hmm. Like oh. like naked eye, two, 300 yep. yards, like, whoa, throw binos up. Like, oh, yeah. Get, <laughs> whoa. The, get the gun, boys. Uh, yeah. Nothing better, dude. Like that spot uh, where you helped me get that deer out, that's how it was that morning when I shot that buck. You helped me get out. It was like, that was right at daylight, but he's caught moving with, like white antler. That buck was with the doe, and um, that, that that is that's to me that's a fun thing about hunting a clear cut. But also the, the hard thing about hunting a clear cut is if you got any kind of wind over like five six mile an hour, God bless you. Mm. Like it's just it's so hard to see that movement because you're never going to see like a full body of a deer. Like you get like an ear here, right. a tail, right. part of it ahead. Maybe you get a little bit of antler, and then after you find it, you're just like trying to find a shot at it. At that point, no matter. Oh uh, yeah, that's just like looking for a shed. I mean, you don't ever look for the whole thing. Yeah, you gotta look for a little bit. And mm-hmm. then you eventually see the whole thing. That's yeah. why I don't ever find sheds. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, Andrew's a little shed, little shed dog over here. And we were That's what I'm on a piece about. of piece of public that we got all those cameras on. And he's like, he starts pointing, like walking up on this little point. I'm like, what are you doing, dude? And he walks 25 yards over, grabs his broken main beam off a. Of yeah, it was half a main beam that was broken off. And it was like down. This in the was crack. like two weeks ago. Yeah, and I was like, it's old. It's an old main beam broke off. It was probably a year or two old at least. And uh, I'm like, how did you see that? Like, you know, and this Always pile, looking. Of, pile of sticks and everything else. I'm like, because it wasn't super bright white either. Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't have that eye, unfortunately. I got, I got. They're usually not real bright white. Yeah. I mean, it, that, that kind of a uh, a little dingy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I do most of my. But if I go out shed hunting, you know, it's going to be on kind of a rainy, overcast day anyway, and. And that's what you look for is just really that bone color, nothing really white, white. Mm-hmm. And but that's just like the deer in the clear cut deal, you know. You, I don't ever really look for the whole deer. If I could just, if I think a bird may have landed on a limb, I'm double checking, you know, just because of that little bit of movement, movement right yeah. there. Um, and then you kind of start putting pieces together, and then you finally make out a whole deer, and then it's like, there it is, you know. That's interesting. Hunting those clear cuts, do y'all ever bring anything to like for the sun? Because I hunted one well, Thursday. Like, like sunscreen? Or? Sunscreen, <laughs> sunglasses. Um, I hunted one and get this, right? I, I, there's no tree to climb. So I got out there mm-hmm. and I found a slash pile that is on top of a hill. So mm-hmm. I'm basically 30 foot above what I'm looking into, mm-hmm. but it's facing east. 
<laughs> <laughs> and when that sun came up, it just it, it's like southeast is the hill. Yeah. So the sun was on me from the time it came up until the time it went down. <laughs> I got absolutely blasted by the sun. And like I didn't bring sunglasses and I didn't bring sunscreen. But I got to looking at it. Dude, you were serious about the sunscreen thing. Yeah. Have y'all I mean, ever done that? You're pasty, bro. I mean, I'm a ginger. I don't, I don't burn that bad. But like, I mean, I, I mean, was it, was it hot? Or do you have long sleeves on? Or? No, just, I mean, it was just my face that got smoked. Man, we got to get smoked, you a, get, but get you a I don't want to get wind burned bad. Yeah. yeah. That wind tears me up. But for like, do y'all do anything for the glare? Because I was so, looking at it through this, with my scope. So and the, unless I shaded it out a little bit, I'm talking there's about no your, way. That, that scope deal with the sun, man, that that's crazy. Yeah. I don't care what scope you got. That, that sun is gonna mess you up. Yeah, some of them will come with that little uh, sunshade. It's like this long, and it screws onto the end of your scope, and mm-hmm. it's it's literally just like a tube. Yeah. That I've never had to use it though, because like I've I have I've I've been in some situations like that, but not not recently. Yeah, I'll say this one advantage. So for if you're climbing a tree on a uh, clear cut. This is to me advantage of like using a tree saddle when you're on the backside of the tree because if that happens, I typically would like get right behind the tree where I'm in the shade. I can like look out like what's not glared out in front of me because I'm not looking directly into the sun and looking around the tree, and it works really good. But if you're on a slash pile like that, God bless you. I mean, maybe not be looking in that direction. Like, I don't care how <laughs> well, bad it is, man. That might be. I probably would be spot. sunburned because I'd be passed out because that sun would feel so good. <laughs> up. Nice That'd crisp morning. Fun. Yeah, you're like, oh man. Oh, I had a I had a hunt like that this past week where dude, I got I was running about four hours of sleep, <clears throat> sitting there in a turkey chair on the ground. That sun came up, dude. It was nice, a little cool morning, dude. I had just seen a bunch of deer and it, like kind of slowed down for an hour or two. I'm like, next, I just I doze off. It's like eight thirty. <laughs> You want to know what time I woke up? Oh gosh, at eleven fifteen. <laughs> Dang! And I'm like, I'm like, I wonder what walked by here. Because I went, so I was, I was hunting some hardwoods, and I'm like, man, it's surely if a deer walks through, because every other deer I, I could hear them. I'm like, I ain't gonna sleep that hard, dude. It's eight thirty. I look. I watch. guarantee you were freaking and, roaring, like, dude, dude, you were snoring so loud. And dude, like, I, when I woke up, I was like, man, I feel pretty good. I'm like, man, I feel pretty rested. And I'm like, man, the the shade on all the trees looks weird. Like, it all looks way different from what it was when I woke up. I think it's like nine o'clock. I look at my watch. It's eleven fifteen. I'm like, oh my god. And my buddy Gabe I was hunting with Gabe. He texted. He hit text me like an hour ago. He's like, "Hey man, how long are you gonna sit?" I'm like, "Oh man, I'm about to leave." He <laughs> <laughs> said, "You see anything?" He said, "I saw the back of my eyelids." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, rough dude, rough. But, um, but yeah, no, there's there's not a lot you can do in that situation. But I, I do take that in consideration if I'm ever hit, sitting a clear cut. Like if I have to look east in the morning, I'm going to try to get as far north or south where it's like the sun's quartering to me. Mm-hmm. Then if I have to look dead at it because yeah that's that's miserable i mean yeah it's it's kind of like driving if you gotta drive eastbound on a on a highway and you're looking right at the sun the whole time dude you know it's a good way to rear in somebody yeah. <laughs> and then like same thing for in the afternoons that's what this afternoon and kind of made the same mistake mm-hmm. except it, i was facing west but even after the sun went down with it being so clear and such a bright s- sunset yeah it was pointless. I, I should have just left 30 minutes before Man, I did. I, I can't ever see through my scope real Exactly, good. yeah. I mean, that's I my like, main thing is if there was a deer out there, mm-hmm. you know, it messes my scope up so bad. Yeah. yeah. That, that's one thing I've always tried to – because I've had – especially I haven't had that situation in the mornings all that much other than the, right when that sun's cresting, but in the afternoon it's real bad. Like you said, like, you know, bluebird day, sky, big sunset. If you're looking towards that sunset – until it's at legal light, like, you can't see anything in that direction. So, like, I started doing this a couple of years ago. If I'm going into a spot and I have to look west, again, I'm trying to shift as far to the south. If it's some kind of northern northerly wind or some so far to the north where, like, that sunset's, like, just off to the right a little bit or just off to the left a little bit where I can kind of see past it. Because, yeah, if you're looking right at me, dude, it's that's so hard in the afternoon. Like, so hard in the afternoon to be able to kind of deal with that. Um, but, you know. It's also one of those situations you never know. You might have a buck pop out right here next to you. Right. You, know, yeah. you ain't got to look that far. Um, so, you know, it, it is really interesting. But I'll say this, uh, kind of getting a point of here wrapping up. Um, Jonathan, when it when it comes to kind of going back to the whole, you know, hunting specific deer thing, if a guy's, you know, had a buck on camera, because I'm sure there's hundreds of listeners, maybe even thousands of listeners that have had this situation happen this year where, like, 
they found a buck, had him on camera, like, dude, I want to put the rest of my season into learning this deer. And if not, I don't kill him this year. I want to learn more about him next year. What data can you learn from this season with trail cameras to apply for next year trying to refine and relocate those bucks? Uh, I do know that their travel patterns normally stay the same the older they get. I mean, if anything, they shrink, you know. Um, their, 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 their core definitely shrinks the older they get. They're a whole lot more predictable. Um, but at the same p- token... If he moves a whole lot, um, man, I, personally, I don't even mess with those deer. Mm-hmm. I mean, because they're so unpredictable whenever they get like that. If they're one of the ones that just move and move and move, like they might be 300 yards over here. They might be half a mile down the road over there. I, unless they're just stupid big, I don't waste my time with those. I like the ones that kind of keep a smaller knit. Area. So it's one of those things like you had a giant show up during the rut and you only get a few images of him and then he disappeared. You're not going to put a lot of effort into trying to locate where that I, core area is. I won't put a camera out looking for him at all unless he keeps showing up on that one, you know, and then that one's going to eventually stay on that tree and mm-hmm. never get moved. Mm-hmm. I'll just start putting some little satellites out there. Okay. Kind of going around. And, and do you have any uh, tips on locating those bucks like how how early do you put cameras out trying to relocate bucks you had history of the year previously oh man um i usually um it's really hard to locate them and stay on top of them while the acorns are full usually right before acorn drop Mm -hmm. man i've got them down to a t and then as soon as those acorns start (laughs) Yeah, that's almost as bad as a rut. You know, they might be over here one day, and they might be over there another, whichever one of the hottest tree is. But um, usually before acorn drop and right kind of pre-rut mm-hmm. is usually, you know, right there at the first of gun season, Thanksgiving and all, up to, you know, the first of December, they're, they're pretty well dialed in, and you can about pinpoint them. Um, but... <sighs> Just don't put too much effort in on one that you're not getting real consistent because who knows what happens to that deer, you know. Somebody else might shoot it. And if they do, like I tell them, like, I don't care that you shot it. I just want to know so I'm not wasting the rest of my season looking for something that's already dead. Like, there's the guys down there. um, They're still looking for that deer that I shot last year. They're still trying to kill it. I know they've done been on both of those hunts down there this year, um, looking for that deer that's already dead in the freezer. So they're wasting a lot of time, you know, um, on something that's already dead. So if I'm still not getting him on camera pretty consistent, let's, let's move on. Yeah. That's a good point. Cut ties and keep rolling. Um, also, one, one other question I've got, how often, because you mentioned like a lot of these bucks, especially when they get to a certain age class, Home range kind of shrinks. Their movement patterns kind of shrink. At least that's what you've seen. Um, how often do you see, like, you kill one of these bucks or one of these bucks die, disappear, whatever, and another mature buck kind of takes the same role in the same location with a similar pattern? Use the same bedding area. I mean, they will. Uh, it's not long. Um, I think once they've, they, they've kind of cycled through and noticed that he's not there anymore, you know, whether if it's a week or two weeks, um, yeah, I'll be back over there hunting that same spot. You know. Oh, that it, quickly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's not like you're waiting till next year. It's no, like, no, 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 no. It's no, like no. okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, because man, ten, and them deer tend to don't really matter which deer, just a deer tends to move those same patterns. And once they know their pecking order, and once they notice he's not there no more, then the next one in line's kind of like my turn. But um, a lot of times it ain't really nothing worth messing with. But Every now and then during the rut, you might have one that comes over and decides he likes this area and then starts hanging out a little bit longer and then just falls right into the one you've already taken out, falls right into their bed. And then it's like, man, I ain't having to change nothing. I can I can go climb this same power pole again and kill him again. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, I'm not. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I within a few weeks, I, I will. I'll go back in there, you know, maybe just hang a camera to see what we got going on. Um, they will. They'll, they'll fall right back in. It don't affect them. 
They just got to figure out who they're picking order, which one they're going to run off or who they're going to mm-hmm. beat up, you know, but it's not long. Interesting. Uh, before we wrap up, Baxley, do you have any other questions? I know, I knew that you were uh, – hey, What's up with this horizontal rub thing you wrote down? <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. I got a whole bunch of stuff. He's got, he's got a whole notepad <laughs> thing right here. But this might be – I mean, this could be a whole other podcast. You know? Oh, well, you know, it's not, bad, <laughs> um, not a bad problem to have. All right, so <laughs> – First, first thing I've got written down is things that, like, the newest hunter. Like, if somebody was going to get into hunting, mm-hmm. these are the things that I wish I had in my backpack before um, I learned or like learned to carry them the hard way. SD card reader, you can use that however you want. If you find somebody's camera out there, you better <laughs> make sure you erase yourself from it if you're going to check it. If you're going to check it, make sure you don't leave your pictures on it. Um, <laughs> A map, obviously, most people have on their phone mm-hmm. now. Uh, don't go walk around, th- walk around out there pointlessly. Um, water bottles, try to carry you a plastic, or not a plastic water bottle, like a hard water bottle. Mm-hmm. Anytime, you, anytime you go to grab a water bottle, it's oh, just yeah, like... Yeah. <laughs> they don't even make good thick ones no more. They're all junk. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like those Dasani bottles yeah. used to be pretty good now. Yeah. They're crap. Yep. Yeah. Same um, environment. <laughs> Especially if you're going to hunt clear cuts or long straightaways, get you a pair of binoculars. I oh, cannot yeah. tell you how many times I took my rifle. I was like, if that I rifle see, gets if heavy I, after if a I, while. Yeah, <laughs> and, uh, if I, if, yeah. That's what my whole reasoning was like, oh, I'm not going to carry those in. That's just no, more weight in my backpack. Well, no, it's actually cutting weight when you're sitting there glassing a clear cut with your rifle for four hours you're like oh my gosh hey, my there's, shoulders there's, some, there's, there's, dying. Someone, there's someone on the other side of the like what the hell is he looking at he's swinging that gun around <laughs> he's like man that deer is all over the place yep <laughs> get exactly. you some binoculars <laughs> oh that's so good and um hey quick one have you ever had deer be affected by the glare from your binoculars if the sun's hitting them mm, no mainly because if a deer, I've never really had them that close. Normally, the closest ones that I have out in the clear cut is because I grunted at them and they're looking for me. Um, that happened to me the other day. I grunted a little buck up, and the only reason he came over there is I'd grunt. He'd go, I, he'd get out of sight, and I'd grunt again. He'd come running up to me and start looking over there. He finally got a hundred yards from me. And it's in the wide open, and he finally saw me and turned around and bounded away. <laughs> It's an educated deer now. Is that happening to you, John? <laughs> Not necessarily with binoculars or anything, but um, I have a I have a couple of years ago recently spray painted my Browning rifle. I got a bolt, 300 wind mag, and the, the one addition that I got the uh, the bolt is like a mirror. You know, it polished, chrome, polished stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, and I got to noticing there was a couple of times that I scared the deer off as I was raising my gun up. And as I was raising my gun up, apparently the chrome to polish bolt, the sun would hit it and just be like, you know, like when people's outside, they open their car door, you like see a flash that goes through your room, your bedroom window or something. I got to notice and when I would pick my rifle up, that's what would happen and the deer would immediately look at me and just take off running. I didn't know if that ever happened with your binoculars and all that stuff. Mm -mm, That's never happened to me. So I ended up coming home and getting me a damn black can spray paint and I spray painted the thing slid it back up in there I've scared them since then but not because of that no more <laughs> took care of that issue and then the last thing this one maybe shouldn't say is a lighter I saw I went on a guided hunt <coughs> through that I won in the uh, deer expo mm-hmm, yeah and took my brother bear hunting in Georgia and our guide instead of using milkweed to check the wind he used a lighter he would flick the lighter on and hold it up. Well, not with, like, straight line winds or anything, but, like, just to make sure that our thermals were pulling the way he wanted them to go. Oh. If, that, if that flame flickered the wrong way, all right, turn around, we're going this way. Or we'll drop on this side of the hill. He would use a lighter to check the wind. I thought that was Ooh. pretty neat. And that way you're not constantly reaching for milkweed and or throwing it up in the air, moving around a lot, you know? You're just sitting here. I thought when you said you shouldn't say that, I thought you were going to say, like, Torch a pine thicket or something. Well, yeah, that's yeah, what this, this that's what's a good fire. <laughs> Smoking well, a little rock while he out there. It's been a bad day today. Hunting's <laughs> <laughs> not been good. <laughs> Damn bears ain't rock. moving. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> 
That is a very good idea, though. I mean, That's in, all, in all honesty. <laughs> because they will. I mean, a lighter is going to go the least. If you breathe on one, mm-hmm. it's going to put it out. That's all I got as far as the stuff that I wish I had in my backpack before I learned it the hard way from not having it or seeing other people having it and wanting it. Um, yeah, we get a lot of questions about that kind of thing. I'll, t- I'll tell you one thing. I carry my backpack <coughs> all the time. Either one uh, like 50-gallon contractor bag or 30-gallon contractor bag, like you know, like the three uh, mil thick stuff, like real thick stuff. Um, or also, I don't typically carry game bags anymore. If I have to pack a deer out, I typically use those bags. Or Andrew's seen these region bags, which yeah. we've talked about on the podcast, which is real thick plastic. Uh, just if like you get a pack of deer out, or if it starts raining, say like I, a lot of times I'll bring a rain jacket with me if I know it's a chance of rain. But if it's like real bad downpour, but I don't want to sit in it instead of get my pants soaking wet, you can. I've actually took one of those bags, ripped a hole in the bottom, and put it on like a damn skirt. And sat there just so the rain didn't like, get on me. And dude, it worked pretty good. You look goofy doing it, but you know, works real good. Yeah, hell yeah, man. I lost a lot of weight in wrestling practice with them things on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they'll, they'll hold water too down there. All that sweat is staying. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, no, that, that, that's a good point. And also, I'll t- I was telling my brother this uh, when he killed that buck out here this past week. Um, that uh, I was like, hey man, you, you got a knife? He's like, he's like, yeah. I'm like, you got a knife, another knife, or a sharpener? He's like, no. And I'm like, what happens if that knife goes dull like, while we're working on it, cutting on a joint or something? He's like, I don't know. I'm like, well, that's going to be a problem then. So, you know, make sure I always, I always typically have two knives. I keep one pocket knife in me in my pocket all the time, but I keep a, a bigger knife in my bag and a, a knife sharpener. And then also, I'll tell you one that a lot of people don't do. You better have an extra headlamp. I don't know how often I've been in the woods, especially if you have a rechargeable headlamp and you forget to charge it, and you're in the woods, you're like, man, that headlights acting a little weird man you know going in on morning sitting like man we said all day i gotta come out in the dark well, this could get a little interesting and uh having Dang. an extra set of batteries or an extra headlamp in your backpack is clutch uh you do go way. in early if you have to wear a headlamp see oh yeah that's d- dark <laughs> <laughs> lord <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm not i'm not you know pull up to the gate at four o'clock kind of guy and four o'clock. we got there earlier than that in the past oh yeah in the past for sure um but you yeah. know it just depends on where you're going and again, the deer are, are nowhere near scared of you in the dark though. no 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 not at all but i'll, I'll tell you this I, I was thinking about this earlier while, while i was hunting in one of these spots i'm like man i think i want to do a podcast episode on hunting community holes you know what like fishing you go crop fishing everybody's got these community holes everybody knows about them and you go in there and hunt or go in there and fish and you know you get boat after boat i feel like there's certain hunting spots that like everybody and their mother knows about and they're good like you know produce some good deer but it's like you know you're in there and there's three other buck guys parked at the same gate as you you might get in there at three o'clock and by the time you walk out at noon there's three other four other trucks sitting there something about hunting community hunting holes yeah which is any two-year-old clear cut around here pretty much (laughs) yeah 100 percent 100 percent yeah there's a bunch of spots like that yeah but uh, anyway, so yeah. Other than that, you actually, get anything else? Nah, not really. I'm gonna have to ask you about these horizontal rubs when we I'm, get off here. You, you got me. My wheels turning. Horse. Okay, so watch a lot of YouTube. Right. The, the guy, the hunting public guys, mm-hmm. they have that dude Ted Miller, where he shoots a deer off of a horizontal rub every year, and he films it from like six different angles because the deer's going in there and hitting that one rub. Yep. And it's like he's got the deer on a string every time. And he's and it's like a it's like a log that this deer is rubbing. Like it, I mean he's I mean it's like that big around and he literally makes it. He like wires it to these other trees and he makes like a horizontal rub like like how you'd make a mock scrape. And they come in there and hit it. Yeah, they come in there and hit it. But yet down here I've never seen anybody do that. I know I've never done it. I've done mock scrapes before. But I like I've never seen anybody be successful. You don't over know what his rubs. explanation for it is. I mean, no. I mean, they well, just show you a video of him. He, I think he said that. Uh, I think he uses a specific kind of of tree that they really like to rub. Like I think he uses a cedar, maybe. Yeah. So what kind of tree around here does a deer like really like to rub? I've got one, but I don't want to say it on the podcast. Yeah, I'm not gonna say it. Those orange like trees, to, you know, when they rub them. It's orange. Yeah. Crap. Oh yeah. Uh, you can see them things from a mile away, but. <clears throat> um, find a big old honking one, cut it down. You go put it 
somewhere else. I think I think it'd work better if you're going to do that. And these be one there they've already one buck's already hit it, and then you go cut that. Oh, get down. go cut an existing rub down and yeah. use that as your. Yeah, I think tomorrow I'm gonna carry my shovel with me when I go check cameras. I'm and gonna take all the hole. I'm gonna take all the dirt out of the scrapes and I'm gonna go move the dirt around when I go check cameras. Uh, oh, I've been wanting to try that actually. Who's for the real. guy? We we have a guy that talked about doing that. <laughs> I'll tell y'all something we get off oh, of here okay. That, <laughs> okay. that I've removed from certain areas before and took to certain areas and okay, I never ever can say that that's worked. Interesting. Interesting. Well, that yeah, it, it'd be. Again, the whole horizontal road things kind of interesting. I think I think it. I can think of two or three spots out here where I found like a sign, like what people call a signpost rub, mm -hmm. where it's just that historical, mm -hmm. like yep. giant, like huge rub. And I've I've had a, I didn't have a camera on the rub, but I had a camera on a scrape, and the rub happened to be in the background. And these deer, including the deadhead that you found mm -hmm. in the spot where his camera was, the deadhead you were looking for. That buck in particular, I had him on camera a mile away in this spot, and he came and hit the community scrape, walked over and hit the rub, went up into this pine thicket, and this is at like 8 p.m., and then at 7 a.m., came out the same trail, hit the rub, hit the scrape, and then went and got killed or something because <laughs> he ended up, you know, as a deadhead that same year. But, uh, but yeah, that's – so he, he they were hitting that rub, and I think, I mean – I'm assuming it's it's got to be kind of the same thing as like a scrape. I mean, it's like a it's like a little thing that catches their attention where they're like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go rub this thing. I don't know what the horizontal. I don't know. Uh, maybe it's just so different it catches their eye or something. Put it right there in front of their face. And Did you like see the thing where it was like the um, the like a mushroom researcher? Oh. Thing. So yeah, this I, guy. I, I shared it with you, I think. So this guy um, was like deer can see like certain wavelengths and basically without I, i'm gonna butcher this but like basically like certain mushrooms are like certain colors and they reflect like ultraviolet light so he had some with like a blue light or whatever and they basically glow and so to a deer essentially these little mushrooms would glow but he, he also shined it on like rubs and stuff and the rubs glowed the same way like, you go down into a bottom and you click your flashlight, whatever special light he was using, and those rubs will, like, light up like reflectors going through there. Like, the deer can see them really good at night, and the deer can see, like, the white on their faces really good. That lights up, the and tail. their tails. But also, it was, like, the preorbital gland. Like or, yeah, the forehead gland. Yeah, he's like, you could see rubs, and you could see that crap smeared all over that rub. And then he had a yeah. buck. I think he said it was a pin buck or something like that. You don't yeah. try this with your deer. And, uh... Anyways, uh, shine the light at, and you could see it glowing on top of their head where all that stuff was at. Yes, like the actual like enzyme oh, or whatever. And so that and yeah, like they're rubbing that forehead gland on it, and that that like glows basically, and they can see it really good. Um, I think that's what that was. Saying. The guy the guy said he sent it to like Mississippi State and everything, and they're supposed to look into it. But I wonder if like the horizontal rub thing, you know, you have all these normal vertical rubs and horizontal rub, they're probably like, look at that. You know, like it, it sticks out and it's different, and so they'll they'll go and check it out. I'm assuming that's what it is. I don't know. Like, what are, what are your thoughts, Baxley? I don't know. That's why I was just gonna ask you. I don't have anything on, or like a hunting club around here, so I was gonna wonder. I was kind of wondering if you've ever done anything like that because you, know. you don't like hunting over corn. So I wonder if I was just wondering if you've ever done anything like that to like lure be, them in, be an attractant. Yeah. Um, yes. I, I do not like to walk where I'm hunting or where I'm going to be kind of like face where I assume I'm going to be facing. But I also want something out there to um, attract them. And I needed to put it out there. Um, if you will, Baxley. A little slingshot can, action? Can you get something out of the freezer right now? Y'all are, are about to be. This is about to mess them up, ain't it? <laughs> All right, you see the little blue thing right there? <laughs> Get that out, and you can shut the freezer back. I ordered this off Amazon. Pelican. I can take dopey. Uh-huh. Fill these up. <laughs> Baxley. Oh, Baxley? Oh my gosh, Baxley. Just shut the door, hey, bro. That, that's fine, Baxley. They do it to me all the time. <laughs> um... 
I have froze dough pea. And these make little, little perfect round balls. I have taken um, them out of the freezer before I leave in the mornings. Pop them into a styrofoam cup. Go get my $10 slingshot. <laughs> Michael Pike is all about this now. Okay, keep going. And I can sit in my stand, and when the sun gets about right, you know, I can take from all different angles them little perfectly round balls, and they will zoom about, you know, 100 yards all over the hillsides in front of them. <laughs> As the sun's coming up and warming them hillsides up, those... This is cheating. Those start... This Why? Is no. <laughs> this is cheating. <laughs> this is ingenious, dude. This is I, I cheating. Thought, hey, look, hey, keep going. Keep going. I've, got, I've, I've had another thought. Keep going. This is amazing. As the temperature warms, those slowly melt. So it's just steadily all throughout the morning putting off dough estrus that I have not had to go over there and touch physically with my feet. You know, just ground disturbance, none. Right, and here I was. I, I've been walking you're, around. You're genius. No, no. Listen. Let me. Let, so I've had my own thought on this. Okay. So, um, <laughs> one. So I'm holding that little tray right here, guys. You, you can find it on our Amazon store. After this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. I just want my cut. <laughs> <laughs> no, but so uh, one of our buddies, uh, uh, Zach, knew he owns a uh, native scent and has, you know, does does deer urine out of Alabama, and he has these gel capsules. Okay. Uh, little gel balls and I don't know if y'all seen these gel blasters that like people are like, using it's like kind of like paintball but with those little gel caps and they, they bust and you can has a little hopper on them. and I was like I asked him I was like dude could I shoot these things out of a gel blaster and like shoot them like that gel blaster never breathe the same 40 to 60 yards away <laughs> you run 100 of those through it well, well, you just throw it in the garbage I, after I, that. I asked no well I asked him and he's like He's like, no, he's like, it's funny you brought that up because we've tested it and they're not the right size for it. But I'm like, could you make me some the right size? <laughs> but then you get, you know, the little battery operator, it'd be loud to shoot one of those things. <laughs> like, you know, it's, it's like, hey, you get the curiosity, I'll be like, what the hell was that? That was my first thought was, was like a paintball gun yeah. or something. Then I thought I'm that's like, where you were going. Slingshot's yeah. way smarter. Oh, yeah, because you can, the little ones from Walmart, you can just fold them up. And, well, just, uh, and I bet you can zing well, them hey, When, when you told them coming out, get out of the freezer, I, already, I was like slingshot, 100%. I was about, I was about to say, yeah. you ever send one at a squirrel or something? You know, yeah, I've <laughs> sent a lot of arrows to one, though. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say that armadillo comes by, you smack the I have. So I have. You run off with of that scent on you. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go. You got to sit <laughs> freaking peg the armadillo. <laughs> You got a hot dough trail. <laughs> Perfect. No, no, no. You catch an armadillo. Okay. Like a water balloon. I, yeah, I don't know what the regs are, but you tie a scent wick to the back of the armadillo, <laughs> smack it on his butt, and just like send it on his way. Send it. Oh, my gosh. Have some kind of barb thing that hangs into it. All you got to do is just hit it, and the barbs will hang in there, and it's not coming out. <laughs> I mean, I used to want to make a GPS tracker for deer that are sticks in them. You know, <laughs> when you shoot them with an arrow, and you'll at least be able to find your deer, you know. But hey, people have made that. Yeah, someone already beat you to it. I know. I started what ten years ago, and then there in the past couple of years, they're like they already. Yeah, made so, it. someone made Damn. it, and I was like, man, because all it was is a giant fish hook with bars. I'm like, dude, that doesn't. I felt like that would kind of hurt your uh, hurt your penetration, you know, with your arrow. He's like, oh no, man, it sticks right in. I'm like, oh. Okay, you're out there with the transmitter, like walking around, like, <laughs> like doing a, like a collar deer study, and uh, oh my god! But uh, no, that, that's a, that's a pretty smart idea for real with the the frozen little capsules and and shooting them with a slingshot. I've I thought about that as well, but I never I didn't think about ever trying to get one of those sh a tray like that where they're like perfectly little round balls. Yeah, it's made for the fancy wine drinkers and stuff, you know. That's got the little cups, the little clear cups, glass things with the. Perfect ice in it. No, it sounds like Andrew. Andrew does that with his bourbon. Oh, you man. You have that perfect ice ball every single time. Oh, I, get, I use the big old square cube. Do one of those with deer urine. It's like, <laughs> just, I mean, like, sound like hey, you and Baxley. You, you need to bring a catapult. <laughs> you and Baxley, it's like a giant slingshot. Y'all hold the front end of it. I'll freaking run back and just slink a couple hundred yards out into a clear cut. Dude, I, all I can think about is if I buy one of those and I put deer piss in it and put it in my freezer, I'm getting divorced. <laughs> you got to have a setup yeah, that's away from the kitchen. You're going to have a you're going to mess around and have a real spicy drink one night. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that buddy comes over like, hey, dude, let me make a drink real quick and drop a couple of those in. No, <laughs> oh, not the blue drink. <laughs> <laughs> Save that for the special guest. <laughs>
<laughs> Especially, you know, there are a couple bourbons in. They're already feeling pretty good. Like, hey, dude, let me make that drink for you. Oh. Like, you use one of these special ice cubes. It's bourbon. Pr- it's, it's it's high high proof bourbon. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, on that, <laughs> let's, shut, let's shut it down. Uh, I think that's a good note to end on. Well, awesome. Well, uh, Jonathan, appreciate you letting us come out, dude, and do the podcast. No problem. Hopefully, maybe we'll do it again. This Bax has got a bunch of other questions, maybe. And uh, yeah, then we got we got to do our our year ender podcast here sometime soon. Get that recorded. It's always a fun one. Did a big shindig last year, and Bax, you got to come to it this year as long as you're going to be in town, sir. I should be. So should be a good time. But awesome. I'll well, uh, have a big old buck dead by then, right? Yeah, hopefully. I've been letting the little ones walk, so. Yeah, dude. If well, not, I might have a little one at the, on the ground. The next one I see, I might shoot him. Yeah, I don't know. Dude. That next four point. <laughs> Getting it. Next spike. <laughs> 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 yeah, but awesome. Well, appreciate everybody watching this podcast. Again, if you're on YouTube, probably uh, enjoyed this episode quite a bit. If you're an li- audio listener, you know, appreciate you listening as well. But uh, you might want to go check out the YouTube version. Again, the YouTube version is definitely a little more spicier. That's the way I, I'm, I'm going to put it. Pretty fun stuff. You see this uh, patented uh deer pee uh cube no not cube tray tray ice. deer pee ice tray deer pee ice tray fully patent pending right now yeah by jonathan himself <laughs> coming to market soon 2024 y'all stay tuned on it but uh anyways appreciate y'all watching appreciate y'all listening and we'll catch you back here in the next episode from the southern outdoorsman podcast and remember guys y'all stay southern